Welcome to our 11th annual In Session Film Award Show. This is episode 567 for January 7th, 2024, and I'm J.D. Duran. And I'm Brennan Cassidy. J.D., good job getting the year right so quickly. (laughs) Thank you. Yep, here we are. It's the 11th annual awards. It is 2024. It's hard to believe we've done this for so many years, but here we are. We are old. the award show. Are Are you ready, Brennan? We started this in our 20s. I know. <laughs> uh, hard to believe, but here we are. Very exciting. One of the most stressful but most fun shows that we do each year. Mm-hmm. And I am so thrilled to bring back for this episode the one and only Ryan McQuaid and Jay Ledbetter. They are back. Welcome, fellas. How we doing? Man, what a time to be back. I missed three four hour podcast so yep. I'm, I'm so, just stoked to be here just that, just ready to be exhausted home after tonight sweet home yeah i'm for ready the video, yeah, it does it feels the, like home for the video uh participants out there i'm recording from the back cave um <laughs> of course literal yeah. back cave literal back cave um yeah. james gunnan uh is officially announcing letting me announce tonight that i'm going to be the new batman Oh, and, uh, there we go. It's Ryan super McQuaid. dark here in the room that That's I'm at. Very so. interesting casting choice. Uh, hey, <laughs> I, always thought, I always saw you as more of a Nightwing. Kind no, of no, what? That's fair, Brendan. But uh, you know, when you've got sexy, you might as well just put it in the right role. You know what I mean? Have you uh, perfected sexy your back. Batman voice yet? Huh, Batman. Oh wait, <laughs> not yet. I haven't really worked on it. Um, it sounded like that one college humor sketch where he couldn't find his voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to work on it. I'll, I'll get maybe by next year. I'll, I'll be able to. All right. Well, you trade. got some time. You got some. I time. got some time, but it's great uh, to be back. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you guys here. It's been a minute since the four of us have been together. So, yeah, this is very exciting. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have you guys back for this award show. And yes, it's to Jay's point going to be four hours long. So Strap in, prepare yourselves. Maybe. It's going to be a lot of fun, though. <laughs> okay. We're going to Brendan have fun. Brendan the Optimist. Yeah. I always try to be. And yeah, I'm the one that's usually the most short-lived when it comes to my thoughts anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So just to lay out how this is going to work in case this is your first in Session Film Awards experience. Uh, we are splitting this episode into two parts. For part one, what you're listening to right now, this is the In Session Film Awards, where we be, we'll be discussing many, many categories. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that here shortly. Some will feel familiar to you. Others are unique and unconventional. For part two, that will be our top 10 movies of 2023. So be on the lookout for that coming very, very soon. Um, and... For each category. So as we get into it, each category, we will each have our own five nominees and a selected winner. Mm-hmm. We will we do this individually. So Brendan's nominations could be different than Jay's, which will be different from Ryan's, which could be different from mine. And of course, the winners will all be very dissimilar as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how we'll do it. That's partially why it goes four hours, but it's also, <laughs> again... A lot of fun. So that's that's what you can look forward to over the Although next I, little bit. I don't think there will be much disagreements with a lot of these films that we talk about because, as we'll get into, this year has been very strong. And I think there's a yeah. lot of greatness we can pull from in many directions, even when we have, what, like 500 categories that we're going to be working with here, right, J.D.? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, those, those first categories obviously being our individual special awards, which are ones that we each personally want to give some type of feature to that wouldn't be an official category at let's say any major awards uh circuit uh and ironically we're recording this the same night as the golden globe so that just just goes to show how dedicated we are we're doing this instead of watching an award ceremony right now Uh, yeah so we we will have some individual special awards which we'll start off with but uh, for the official categories that we'll get to from there they will include best discovery best surprise actor or actress best surprise movie best overlooked movie Best opening or closing credit sequence or scene. Best use of soundtrack music, which could be either an original song or a needle drop of some sort. 
Best Original Score, Best Animated Film, Best Foreign Language Film, Best Documentary, Best Cinematography, Best Adapted Screenplay, and then Best Original Screenplay. And then we get into the heavy hitters. Best Director, Supporting Actress, Supporting Actor, mm -hmm. then rounding out with both Lead, Actor, and Actress to close out the show. All right. So, yes, a lot to get into there with the Incession Film Awards. Before we get into it, I also want to reiterate that if you missed last week's show, episode 566, we also talked about the best scenes of 2023, if you want to go and check that out. All right, with all of that laid out, let's begin the 2023 In Session Film Awards. As Brendan noted, we are starting with our own individual special awards. Who wants to go first? Shall we start with Jay or Ryan? Where, where do we want to go? I'll, I'll take it. Let's do Jay? it. Yeah, let's let's, let's do, do our it. normal order. It usually goes Jay, Ryan, right. myself, and JD. So why don't we just keep let's the do tradition let's keep, alive? Keep the tradition going. All right, Jay, kick it, kick us off here. All right, this is where I cook. So uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's get these. No things pressure. Going. Timer no pressure. is on. Uh, <laughs> my first award, which is an extraordinarily sincere award, is the greatest achievement we will not recognize tonight, and that award is going to Jennifer Lame's editing in Oppenheimer, which I think is like. Maybe the best thing anybody did in a movie this year. So yeah, yeah, good call. Uh, we will not good specifically call. talk about that. Uh, how about the movie you most forgot came out in 2023? The nominees mm -hmm. there are You People, uh, 65. Oh my god, Hypnotic, <laughs> okay. Strays, and the winner, Boston Strangler. Remember that one? No, oh, you don't. No, it I don't. Didn't even really come out. I, I kind of um, remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it now, so it just yeah, proves, yeah, yeah. proves how accurate it, your category yeah. is. Yeah, I remember Zodiac, which the people who saw that movie certainly saw and tried to copy. Uh, yeah. This is a very important category for this year. Hat of the year. Huge year for hats. Okay. Um, and the nominees here are going to be Oppenheimer's Wide Brim Fedora in mm. uh, Oppenheimer. Yeah. Nice. Paul Giamatti's soft brimmed oh, fedora yeah. in the holdovers and the killer's bucket hat in the killer. And you can go any direction here. I there there is no bad option here, but for me, the hat of the year is the killer's bucket hat. I, I think it's hysterical. So that's a okay. great one. That, that's yeah, gonna great. be like that's gonna be my pick. We might we might have different picks there, but uh that's the one I'm going with. Uh next award is the huh award. Um <laughs> and this award is gonna go to Shailene Woodley in Ferrari. <laughs> which I think is pretty self-explanatory. Um, my next award is going to be the... Poor girl. I'm going to call it The Teary, which is the most tear-inducing film of 2023. Uh, this one is actually sponsored by Kleenex. Um, and the nominees are The Iron Claw, Past Lives, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And mm -hmm. I'm going the Iron Claw. That one made me cry uh, like a baby. So oh, congratulations sure, sure. to the Iron Claw. Okay. Uh, this next award is the Cabbage Patch Kids Award for Biggest Movie Trend of 2023. We've got two nominees here. Um, the runner-up is going to be, I guess every big documentary is just a celebrity portrait now. I think The Last Dance may have broken documentaries. Um, <laughs> but that's where we are in 2023. But yeah. the winner... Is going to be the the trend of brand movies this year. Flame and mm. Hot, Air, mm. Blackberry, others that I'm forgetting right now. That yeah. was like a huge the thing this movie. year. Yeah, it's a yeah. corporate movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So congratulations to uh, brands. Um, <laughs> yeah, because they trophies need more in the love. mail. <laughs> okay. um, how about the I Can't Quit You Award, which is the award for the director who I seem to just continue to like despite everyone else sort of checking out on them. Uh, okay. Guy Ritchie. Look, hey, Operation like Fortune, last year. bad, bad, bad film. Mm -hmm. uh, but The Covenant is like really good. And I continue to I like defend yeah. Guy Ritchie. So Guy Ritchie. Good score too. Keep doing you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the We'll Give You a Pass Award this year uh, is going to go to Alden Ehrenreich, who had a great comeback year with between Oppenheimer and Fair Play. He was knocking it out of the park. Uh, and also he was in Cocaine Bear. We'll Give You a Pass, Alden. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I totally, that's the these one just, I forgot these, about. Cocaine Bear. How did that miss the last category? Yep. Well, on. or the one earlier. Uh, see, I don't forget that that one came out because I viscerally hate it. Uh, so, so it's very much in my mind. Okay. But uh, yeah, that's understandable. Uh, the yeah. next <laughs> award is the Uh Oh Spaghettios Award. Um, the nominees here 
Uh, the runner-up is going to be superhero movies. Uh-oh. What's going to happen? We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good point. But the winner for the Uh-oh SpaghettiOs Award is going to be whoever at Universal brokered the deal to pay $400 million for the new Exorcist trilogy. Yes. Uh, I hope you still have a yes. job, my friend. No. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh-oh SpaghettiOs. SpaghettiOs. Wow. I mean, that. yeah, it's factoring that into that film's budget. That film was a failure. Massive yeah, failure. A right? little no bit. Doubt. Just yeah. a little bit. Uh, next, wow. we're gonna have the fever dream moment of the year. Uh, one of the, the the awards that people most look forward to every year. Uh, the nominees are going to be the uh, babies falling from the skyscraper in the Flash. Oh my God. Wonder Woman inexplicably showing up at a child's funeral in Shazam Two. Yeah, that's a little Ray Liotta odd. getting his guts devoured by a bear. Uh, shortly after he died in That's real life, two that truly bear felt like a, a already. A, yes, there yes. might be some more. They're dominating the night. <laughs> um, anytime Zach Galifianakis showed up in the beanie bubble without his beard, which is truly the most terrifying image of 2023. Oh my god! Okay. Um, and the winner by a landslide is Scuttlebutt from The Little Mermaid. Um, Everyone's which favorite. unfortunately yeah. no one can accept the award tonight because everyone involved is currently in federal prison for their involvement <laughs> in that scene. Um, but one of the few scenes I do like in that movie, actually. Okay. All right. Look, to go to go somewhere. On your, on your top 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, I finally, like one of the most important awards of the night, to be honest, it's the Robert Zemeckis, please retire award. Oh, I, yeah. I love this one. Yeah. I love it. And, um, Look, we we had some we had some usual suspects this year. I'm gonna I'm gonna just hands up right off the bat. Didn't see the boys in the boat. As far as I'm concerned, George Clooney has already stopped making movies, so he is not he does not qualify for this. Unfortunately, uh, he has won in the past, obviously. Uh, yeah. But the nominees are going to be Elizabeth Banks again for Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> we, already. we do not give Elizabeth Banks enough credit for having one of the worst directorial filmographies in the game right now. She is off to a horrific start. Oh, um, she's got three, David Gordon right? Green. She's got she did a Pitch Perfect 2, which I like Charlie's. Oh, oh Jesus. Uh, Ooh, Charlie's yeah. Angels <laughs> and not see. Cocaine Bear. Bad. Uh, next, we've got David Gordon Green, who I like in general. But if this is what you're going to keep doing, retire. Stop. Don't do this. Don't yeah, be the... That would be my pick, probably. Horror reboot guy. Yeah. Uh, and the winner for me, Rob Marshall, The Little Mermaid. Rob Marshall, you're a hack and a half. Get out of here. I'm sick of you ruining movie musicals. I'm over it. about Scuttlebutt? Let me tell you. No more. You no really more. hated Scuttlebutt that bad. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> sc 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 scuttlebutt. <laughs> It's funny, yeah. When, when Rob okay. Marshall's best movie is not even a uh, movie musical, that's saying something. Because I think his best movie is still Memoirs of a Geisha. I, I still like Chicago, but I love Chicago. I can't can't do it. Can't do it. Can't yeah, get into can't it. Chicago, yeah. That's the well, one. That's a, that's a shame. He rebuilt me. movie musicals and then broke them. Tore them down. Yeah. 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 Good job. Yeah. Good job, Hollywood. Well, that was that was fantastic, Jay. Thank you for thank you setting the tone uh, that we can't live up to. <laughs> <laughs> set of nominees there all right, what the Ryan, hell what you do guys you are talking about now i'm screwed and this this is why i <laughs> probably should have gone that. first I, I, yeah i never I, I should never do this just don't bother and just I, don't bother let's I save mean, time honestly, right now i mean honestly i i saved brendan from having to follow up on it so uh um, <laughs> thank welcome. you thank uh, you for existing welcome. right now so i'm just i just have three categories um and uh as usual uh the uh, honorary brendan Cassidy best trailer of the year award uh, there weren't a lot of great trailers this year. I, I thought uh, I was uh, uh, so. This is more of a, of of an anticipation for two of our cinematic ach achievements of uh, 2024, I believe. So um, uh, the Brendan Cassidy uh, Best Trailer Award this year goes to Argyle and uh, and to God. Madam Web uh, because oh I, I've, so you're going I've with never... the ironic angle this time. Yes, uh, I've. Uh... He's going with the cynical angle that I usually take. The Argyle the angle trailers. makes my head hurt. Yes, the Madam <laughs> Web. I have a lot of questions, uh, and usually the that would be the um, it doesn't like Cinema Logic is usually what I've done in the past, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought I uh, consolidate uh, due to time this year and uh, say uh, those are the most anticipated movies coming into this year. And uh, oh, for so sure, sure. for sure, can't yeah, wait for all four of us to come back and talk later. about 
Madam Web. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Man, we, I think we speak sarcasm really well. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. We do. It's uh, mm-hmm. my second language. Uh, speaking of sarcasm, uh, the uh, first ever Adam McKay Please Stop Award. And uh, and that's <laughs> and that recipient, uh, of course, is the writer director of Leave the World Behind, Sam Ismail. Stop. Just stop it. <laughs> yeah, we already saw what we saw what you tried to do. I don't know. And pretty enough. potent social commentary, in my opinion. No, it's a pretty stupid movie. Um, I still have yet to see it. Yeah, I watched I, it. Blind spot for me I, I like Mr. Robot. I like the show Mr. Robot. And I like what he did there. But let me just say this. Sam Ismail must love Panic Room. Must love yeah. it. <laughs> he must think he's David Fincher, <laughs> but in all actuality, he's a hack. Anyway, um, yeah. and kind of building off of Jay's award of uh, uh, essentially my award version of it is uh, the first ever. Did that come out? Award. Mm. And uh, and you have to say it like that. Did that come out? Did that come and, out? And um, the, uh, the winners, there's multiple winners for that. Uh, Total Killer. Totally Killer. Whatever that thing is. See, I can't uh, even Oh, the, the yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Missing, been missing on a lot of uh, critics' ballots. Oh um, yeah, I think you should. I think you should call this this "Oh Yeah" award. Yeah, the "Oh Yeah." <laughs> oh yeah, that that one. Yeah. Renfield. Yeah. Remember when when we thought a Nicolas Cage vampire movie was good? Yeah, yeah. really screwed Featuring that one the up. The star of Scuttlebutt. Yeah, the performer of Scuttlebutt. <laughs> there you go. Sixty-five, as mentioned, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, of course the Boston Strangler, uh, because that is. Uh, uh, the movie that we all are uh, logging on Letterbox every day. Inside, no, not oh, Bo Burnham. Yeah, oh yeah, Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. Movie. Yeah, I never, saw I never did catch up with that one. Operation Fortune. I bet Guy uh, Guy Ritchie wishes he forgot about it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> did any uh, of us see that? Did I didn't I see saw it. that. I saw yeah. it on a plane. Again, I'm a Guy Ritchie was, completist. Wasn't that supposed to come out in like 2021, but they just never yeah, released that got, it? I, I think yeah, that's right. Like three yeah. times. I saw, it on, I saw it on a plane, and I thought, man, I can't wait to get off this plane. Um, yeah, it's not even a good plane movie. Yeah, that's a, that's like, I, I wanted to pull the door. The open. cast is good bad, too. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Emily, you guys remember Emily? No, no, because no one saw it. And of I course, seriously don't even remember this movie. This has been a great year for so many auteurs. That remember when Magic Mike: The Last Ride came out? The last dance. Last ride. Oh, yeah, I think about that. that. I, I, I think one. about that film regularly. I, I don't like it. Didn't remember it until. Literally yesterday, when it's I was a, looking at my uh, letterbox list, and I went, "Oh, that's right." I think that's Steven one of the most. had a movie out this year. I think it's one of the most unfortunate movies of the year. Yeah, yeah I, I, a, I, I don't think it's one. terrible. It's just it's a it's a big wasted opportunity. Yeah. Sody, Sody pop. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. that. Yeah, it had no had no fizz to that soda pop. That's for no. sure. But anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Brendan. It's all yours. All right. Well, I mentioned the word wasted or words rather wasted opportunity. That's my first category here. Best high concept wasted opportunity. A lot of movies had really high concepts that really didn't realize their potential. So this is really my quote unquote negative award of my personal ones. The nominees I have here are Dream Scenario, El Mm. Conde, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One, Mm. Renfield, Talk to Me, and my winner, Cocaine Bear. Cocaine Bear makes another he win. Makes another appearance. Another Dang. appearance here. Man, bear Jay started something here with Cocaine sweeping Bear. Sweeping them up. Yeah. Uh, this is this is definitely going to set the tone. Our listeners are probably leaving right now. I think we're only going to be talking about Cocaine Bear. Um, my next category here, this is one that you've done a few times, Jay. I'm actually surprised you didn't do it again, but that's your uh, best oh. performance by an animal or yes. a non-human. I often call it my Cheddar Goblin Award. Mm-hmm. I've got four nominees here. I've got Messi, the Border Collie from Anatomy of a Fall. I've got Chaplin the dog from Fallen mm-hmm. Leaves, uh, Napoleon's horse from Napoleon, mm. and my winner, Snoopy from Maestro. Oh, okay. Snoopy, <laughs> oh, I love that. I would give it to Chaplin. <laughs> I almost did do this one, I, but I, yeah, I, I was going to give it to Chaplin. I would, I would say Chaplin's the best named animal of the year. Uh, I love, love that name. I've, Does I've often talked about that. Dog from Robot Dreams count as an animal performance. Mm. I try to avoid the animation category for this. Okay, um, but yeah, if I were to yeah, include you get into animation, some real sticky territory when you go into animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though I am including you know fair. an inflatable Snoopy question. in my in my one okay. winner here, uh, I also have for another category here best insult of the year. I have three nominees. I'm sure there are more that I could think of, but I didn't get a chance to think harder on this. But the three I have here are: I'm from Waterloo, where the vampires hang out. From Blackberry. Hell yeah. Okay. I've got, 
I have known you since you were a boy, so I think I have the, requi the, re the requisite experience and insight to aver that you are and have always been penis cancer in yeah, human form. That's good. That's Obviously, really Paul good. Giamatti from The Holdovers. My winner, of course, comes from Napoleon. You think you're so great because you have boats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. My last my last category here is a bit of a serious one, though, and I think it's best movie about the connection between two lost souls, which I feel like was kind of a common theme in a lot of movies. And the nominees here, and I don't actually have a winner. I'm just trying to celebrate all these movies, but I have six nominees here, which include All of Us Strangers, Fallen Leaves, Monster, mm -hmm. Past Lives, Robot Dreams, and The Taste of Things. And I'm sure there are more you could probably lump into that category, but those are the six that first came to mind. But it's definitely been a reoccurring theme for a lot of movies this year, and I wanted to at least yeah. highlight that. You could throw Godzilla minus one in there. Yeah, That's actually a really good point. Okay, Godzilla minus one is included. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I love a collaborative effort on the nominees hey, and yeah. categories. Hey, <laughs> teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Exactly. All right. Great stuff, fellas. Uh, I hate to disappoint everyone. My nominees, my categories for my individual special awards are a little less silly than the three previous <laughs> <Boo>. <laughs> that we've gone through. So I apologize. I know. This is that I moment of the show where I everybody goes to be goes the pretentious the one of the group. I, I know we're going to get score track. That's your favorite one you always yeah, do. So that's, that's what I'll start off with. This is okay. best score track. We're talking individual tracks here. My nominees are, and I'm also cheating here a little bit because I have six mm -hmm. nominees, but uh, my nominees are Falling Apart by Daniel Pemberton from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Falling Blocks from Lorne Balfe in the film Tetris, The Sacred Pipe slash Osage Oil Boom. Technically, Technically, those are two different tracks, but they're edited as one seamless track on the yeah. soundtrack. Yeah. So I'm counting them as one. That's, of course, Robbie Robertson, Killers of the Flower Moon. Can You Hear the Music? Ludwig Gordonson from Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. Carmen's Main Theme by Nicholas Bertel for the film Carmen. All, and this is a cheat uh, in the sense that it's not an original score technically, but I have to go with that that kind of opening main theme from Michelle Legrand in May, December. It's kind of reorchestrated, kind of reamped for that. It's film. reinterpreted. So there's a mixture of originality and cover so, version kind of happening. So yeah, there. it's a, a little bit of a cheat, but I'm still going to include it here. Yeah. As far as my winner goes, pick any one of them, honestly. Yeah, don't <laughs> like, bother. I don't care. They're, they're all winners in our hearts. That's where I feel. I will say this, though. The one I listen to the most partially because it's been out the longest, but it's such a banger of a track is Falling Blocks from the film Tetris. It is incredible. Mm. It is mm -hmm. so, so good. Uh, but yeah, I love all of those uh, nominees there. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about best overlooked film here in just a little bit. Yeah. But I want to, my, my next category is best overlooked performance. And I'm looking at this a little more broadly some of these names might be brought up tonight. I don't know where you guys stand. So I'm okay. looking at this from a more larger perspective. These are performances that aren't really being talked about all that much. All right. So my nominees here, I have Rossi de Palma from the film Carmen. Mm, Mads okay. Mikkelsen in The Promised Land. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Ironically, she's nominated for the Glows, but outside of that, there's been no talk here. Alma Poitsy for the film Fallen Leaves. Mm -hmm. Teo Yu for the film Past Lives. And my last nominee here is Bradley Cooper. Not for Maestro. Guardians D &D. of the Galaxy Volume 3. Oh, I thought you were going D&D. &D. I thought that, you were going for Tiny, <laughs> for tiny D &D. Coops. But <laughs> I'm going Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. That's Mini the Cooper, performance like he should be nominated for. Nice work there, Ryan. Mini Cooper, is that what you just called him? A little Mini yeah, Cooper. <laughs> uh, but my perform <laughs> my my winner for this is going to be again pick, just pick one out of a hat. I, I guess I would have to go with Tao U for past lives, for reasons that may, might become more clear as we go throughout yeah. this show and maybe even into part two. For sure. Uh, the next category I will talk about is best directorial debut. 
My nominees are Cord Jefferson for American Fiction, Celine Song, Past Lives, Raven Jackson for All Dirt Roads, Tastes Like Salt, A.V. Rockwell for A Thousand and One, and Kyle Edward Ball for Skinny Marink. And my winner will become extremely clear as we go. <laughs> and especially oh, we, I think we all know two. what that winner is. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just leave it as at that. Uh, the next category for me is biggest laugh of the year. My nominees are Monk being Stag R. Lee in American Fiction, the theater scene from Fallen Leaves, mm-hmm. Paul throwing the football in the holdovers, <laughs> the hotel sequence in Joyride, the football players wearing their whole gear throughout the whole movie in Bottoms, and the mm-hmm. aforementioned you think you're so great because you have boat boats and Napoleon. Um, I, the real answer is probably fallen leaves, but I will say or, <laughs> the Paul throwing the football in the holdovers is an image. I can't get out of my mind. That, that That's a more <laughs> universal so form of comedy. I feel like the theater scene in fallen leaves really just speaks to people like us. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's yeah my so, so it's, it's sure. yeah, it's more subjective in that regard. Can I, yeah. can I, can I say something real quick about Napoleon? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the cinematic misfire of the year. Um, as much as everyone's been talking award. about, uh, yeah, should have. Well, there you go, new award right there. Um, <laughs> misfire, like uh, like the, I don't know, the cannons on the boats. I don't give a shit. Um, anyway, <laughs> everyone talks about the uh, what? What is it? The the you look, so, you know, you think you're so great because you have boats. The pork chop line is the one that it really is. The That's killer. a good one too. Yeah. That's a great no, line. No yeah. one talks about that line. That That's one. Is, Destiny that is brought me this lamb chop. I love. Yeah, it. exactly. There you yeah. go. Yeah, exactly. that is a fun award because it really kind of speaks to. Obviously, it's very subjective to your taste of humor. I think when I might have laughed the hardest all year was when Michael Fassbender botched the hit job at the beginning of The Killer. Yeah. Um, which is a very dark moment of a woman getting murdered, but it yeah. made me laugh. It's a lot. very, it's very cryptically funny. Like, like yes. that, that, that film is very cryptic. The killer is a very much a like barometric, funny. yeah, funny movie. measure of of that humor. That, 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 that it's it's a Rorschach test for comedy. Yes, yes when exactly. he eats that hardball egg, gold. Absolute gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some really great moments in that film for sure. I particularly love the moment when he pins the guy with the the nail gun, expecting that he'd survive for like another two minutes and totally miscalculates the time. (laughs) Yeah, it's so good. That whole movie is him just going about his job as the most practiced guy in the world, like precise guy, and then slipping on a banana peel every time he walks into a room. It's uh, Mm -hmm. it's the best. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Good stuff. Uh, And then my last uh, category here is best poster of the year. My nominees are Poor Things, The Zone of Interest, The Iron Claw, American Fiction, and Anatomy of a Fall. And my winner is Poor Things. I Mm. will say though this as well before we move on. On, I'm not going to get into it for time purposes, but on the website, Mm -hmm. uh, when we throw out our list of nominees and winners, I will also include best production design and best editing. I do have those listed out here as well. All right, let's go ahead and move on from individual awards and get into the main categories, if you will. Uh, We're starting off with Best Movie Discovery. So this could be any individual from any film in 2023 that we were not familiar with, but we see great things for in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And again, to emphasize clarity, because we've had some responses in the past when when talking about this from listeners, we're not talking about movies. We're talking about actors, directors, cinematographers, composers, individual artists from these films that we discovered throughout the year. So with that laid out, kicking it back over to you, Jay, what do you have for best movie discovery? Yeah, my nominees for this category are Dominic Sessa, the kind of uh, Mm -hmm. newcomer from The Holdovers, Mm -hmm. Celine Song, director of Past Lives. Like on a personal level, even though this person has been making movies forever, Aki Karasmaki, never seen a movie from Karasmaki before and watched Fallen Leaves this year, and that was kind of a revelation. Uh, Rain Allen Miller, the director of Rye Lane, which I think is one of the kind of under-discussed films of the year. And then 
Jewel Taylor, who directed They Cloned Tyrone, a mm-hmm. classic example of a movie that got buried because it was on Netflix. But yep. mm-hmm. for me, my discovery is going to be Aki Karasmaki, not just because of what might come in the future, but because of all the stuff I get to go back and watch. Uh, so there's on a, a lot personal yeah. level. Yeah. Karasmaki is going to be my discovery of the year. OK, good stuff. Brian. Awesome, Jay. Awesome. Um, well, my nominees are Dominic Sansa for The Holdovers. Truly a great performance to hold his own against Giamatti in, in that film. Uh, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla. Uh, Celine Song for Past Lives. Screenwriter Sammy Birch for May, December. And then also another director, uh, Raven Jackson for All Dirt Roads, Taste mm. of Salt. And... Um, and my winner here is 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 Celine Song, um, for reasons that I'll get into plenty through this show and the next show. But uh, I had the chance to sit down with Song uh, this year at Awards Watch, and uh, she was an incredible interviewer. She's very very uh, detailed, and and she just has her pulse tapped into us already with her debut. She's already starting to make her next film just a filmmaker that I have the mm-hmm. utmost confidence in is going to keep delivering great films. And it's such a personal movie past lives for her. And um, I think that that personality is just going to carry over into the next project. Yeah, I agree. She's a nominee for me as well as lo- uh, alongside Dominic Sessa for the holdovers. Uh, also Sammy Burke screenwriter for May December. So I've got three nominees there that we've already talked about in some capacity. Mm-hmm. My two others here are Sherry Cola actress from joyride. Uh, and Milo Mikado Grenier, the young actor from Anatomy of a Fall. I'll echo Ryan, though. I think Celine Song is the one that shows a particular form of promise that just excites me the most. And that's why she's also my winner here. A little fun fact, and I think I saw this on Twitter from our friend Daniel Hallett, that isn't her husband the writer of the new film uh, Challengers, uh, Luke Guadagnino's next film? I heard that That is correct. That is correct. That's yes. so interesting. Yeah, I think I, I, it, 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 it runs in this new cinematic family. A, I guess. a movie, a movie, Brendan, about a love triangle. Yeah. Nepo husband. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. Not. <laughs> Wonder what they were writing about during the pandemic. <laughs> Sharing notes, maybe, from across oh, the Oh, no, man. Who would have thought that Challengers yeah. and Past Lives would become the, 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 the defining companion piece? of the yeah. entire year. Wow. Uh, the, 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 the defining pairing there, but anyway, Celine song really looking forward to what she has to do next. Yep. I echo you guys. Celine song is incredible. What she does with past lives, a nominee for me as well. As far as my other four nominees, I also have Sammy Birch writer for may December. I have director Kyle Edward ball for skin and Marink. I'm mm-hmm. deeply excited to see what he can do with a bigger budget. <laughs> I have Maria Von Hauswolf, the cinematographer for Godland. Striking, absolutely striking. Mm -hmm. And then I also have Ayo Adibri, actress, obviously. She had a huge year with Bottoms, Theater Camp, uh, Mutant Mayhem, and of course, uh, Across the Spider-Verse. And the bear. Gotta watch that bear. Oh, yeah. I have not watched the bear yet. Absolutely. Haven't got to that as well. You know, my time is, is pretty limited these days. Uh, but with all of that said, as much as I agree with you guys about Celine Song and Past Lives, she was my winner for debut of the year. And again, we'll talk more about her as we go. So my winner for this category is actually going to be Io Adibri. I loved her in everything that she did this year. She had an un- unbelievable year, not just being in all of those movies, but being one of the best components of all of those movies. Jay, I know you mentioned earlier, comedy is subjective. It very much is, so maybe this is just a subjective pick for me. But I think she has the potential to be one of the very great comedic performers of her generation. She's utterly magnetic, absolutely hysterical, and even given her persona on Letterboxd, I want to see what she does when she has more resources, when she is able to write her own scripts. Who knows, maybe even direct her own movies. I think she has so much untapped potential. It was a great Mm -hmm. year for comedies, especially studio comedies. And she was a highlight. Absolutely a huge highlight, a big discovery for me. I cannot wait to see what she does. Watch the bear. 
The Bear might be better than everything we talk about tonight. So I would recommend watching The Bear. <laughs> That's all I've heard of this. Well, is that it's amazing. It's everything tonight, but yeah, okay. it's great. All right. Moving on to Best Surprise Actor or Actress. I'd say this is pretty self-explanatory, but mm-hmm. any performance throughout the year that surprised this for any number of reasons. Jay, what do you have as your nominees for this category? Yeah, my nominees are going to be Charles Melton because I only knew him as like the teeny bopper Archie guy, uh, Josh Hartnett, even though he'd made some comebacks in my yeah. guy, Guy Ritchie's movies. Yeah, uh, guy, mm-hmm. guy Ritchie was really the one that started the heart renaissance, and I want that on the record. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Benny Safdie, just because as far as narratives are concerned, the breakup of the Safdies was like a really weird thing, and I was like, really, mm-hmm. Benny's trying to be an actor? And then I saw his acting performances, and I was like, oh, wait, he's actually one of our great young actors. Uh, so that happened. Uh, Kaylee Spaney as has been mentioned a couple times already. Mm -hmm. And Harris Dickinson, not because I didn't think that Harris Harris Dickinson wasn't a good actor, but because I didn't know he had Texas wrestler in him. And boy, oh boy, did he have Texas wrestler in him. So yeah, he does. uh, Shout out Harris Dickinson. But my winner is going to be Benny Safdie because I was following that Safdie breakup so closely and I was so frustrated. And then I saw his very different performances in Oppenheimer and Margaret and then The Curse, if you want to delve into... Uh, the, the TV oh, world, yeah. and it's like, yeah. okay, so I guess I understand why he might want to do that, as as befuddling as it might seem on the surface for the Uncut Gems guys to break up. Mm-hmm. He's a really good actor. And then I also just rewatched Licorice Pizza, and he's awesome in that too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Benny, Benny Safdie, my pick. Okay. No, I right. love that. I love that, Jay, and that's why Benny Safdie is also a nominee for me. Look at that. Particularly for Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. I think he's... Yeah, that was, was the so, one that kind of came out of nowhere. I was like, yeah, It's really gentle. Yeah. heck is this... Per- yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he's yeah. absolutely fantastic. And, uh, Jacob Elordi for Priscilla. I always thought he was, you know, mm-hmm. a, a Sam Levinson sort of creation, and that's never a good thing. And, uh, <laughs> he's so tall. And he, he's so tall, <laughs> yeah. so beautiful. I could... How much time do we have about Jacob Elordi? Uh, but anyway... Um, and all the bacon that he ate for Priscilla. Oh, he's going to be Frankenstein now. He's a big piece of bacon yes. I like to eat. Yeah. Anyway, um, his performance in Priscilla, great. Um, Claire Foy and all the strangers. Listen, I don't hate Claire Foy. I was just surprised. These last three ones, I was surprised at how much they stayed with me for actors that usually their performances usually don't stay with me a lot. Sure. And so Claire Foy's performance in all the sta- strangers, it really stayed with me. Um, and I think it might be some of the best work, if not the best work of her career. Um Viola Davis in, in Air. Uh, usually that movie would feel like that, like, you know, that's just going to be a throwaway kind of performance. Viola Davis just put all of it. Finally, into Viola Davis putting it together. <laughs> I just, I just didn't feel like, I felt like some of the last couple of performances. Os- of been Oscar like, winner, I, what? I mean, I would say this performance is better than Fences. And, uh, and, wow. I, and I like this a lot. Okay. Yeah. And uh, last one, because, um, you know, there's a ton of performances in Opera that you could talk about and put in this spot. Um, but for three minutes in that movie, uh, Casey Affleck's the most terrifying thing. And I was surprised. Yeah, he was almost been, a nominee for me. He yeah. was like yeah. low yeah. key, just like not hanging. You know, he's not been discussed a lot about just how terrifying his scene is um but my winner is is jacob alordi for priscilla uh, yeah. far be it so to say tall. The, so last year we had a we had a what do you call it a a, a big austin butler assance and everybody mm-hmm. just started like fawning no, themselves do over. Well, don't uh, don't jump him over austin butler on the on the superstar 2023 showed that mm-hmm. somebody could really play elvis and no. be the better no, performance, one hundred percent for me. It's, a, it's no, such I, a hey, different I, performance. I, I'm just I'm I, not even gonna. I don't think the comparisons I, are even worthy of talking about. It. I agree. I, I agree. Asking I, for different things. I, it's funny how I let you guys talk. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> I want that really do, noted on the record. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I think Alordi. Yes, I think between his performance and that, and his performance in Saltburn, he had a really strong year. Uh, really, be able to show that he is more than just the the television. Uh, I, I wouldn't even say star, just kind of performer that he is. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that uh, his work there is is fantastic. There's a menacingness to it that is not explored 
or has been explored a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I think in, in performances about Elvis Presley. And I think that, um, I think, yeah, there were moments like there's a moment when he is standing outside the car, um, in the first act of the film, waiting to pick up Priscilla. And he looked exactly like Elvis Presley. He carried himself like that. And guess what? Uh, he has a normal speaking voice still. So there you go. Just, That's all you have to say. Six, six inches taller. Man, that guy's tall. What a cool last so name. Tall. What a cool last name. Might have the coolest last name of all time. Alordi? Yeah. yeah. Good Lordy, Alordi. Yeah. Lordy, so Lordy. I love it. Uh, That'll be the next t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Write it down. Write it down. That's a winner right there. Um, <laughs> my nominees for Best Surprise Actor or Actress include Melissa Barrera for Scream 6, mm. uh, Dave Bautista for Knock on the Cabin, mm. Bradley Cooper for Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Hell yeah. Patrick Dempsey for Ferrari, Ooh. Um, and Marshawn Lynch for Bottoms. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> dang it. I should have put Marshawn Lynch. I, totally I should have put Marshawn on my list. Oh, that's a good one. That's a great one. That's yep. a great one, Brendan. Oversight. Yeah, and, and I almost I almost gave it to Marshawn Lynch uh, just for those reasons that you guys are also alluding to there. But, you know, my winner here is actually M Melissa Barrera for Scream 6. And it's mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with all the commentary around Scream mm -hmm. 7, which I don't want to get into. But if anything, it's really emblematic of how her performance in Scream 6 is probably the biggest cinematic improvement in performance I think I can remember seeing in a long time. I yeah. think she is the worst thing in Scream 5. Uh, Scream 5, I don't care for. I think she is far and away the worst thing in it, though. I agree. Um, I, 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 whatever new direction she got between Scream 5 and Scream 6, it's I, honestly, it, it almost felt like a completely different person. I, I've wow. never seen that kind of improvement, at least in a genre film like this. So just because of that jump, I feel the urge to give it to her. And honestly, I, I think she's the best thing in Scream 6. I was really interested in what the character of Sam Carpenter was going to do and represent in this saga going forward. And it's unfortunate that given these circumstances, we're not going to see that happen. Um, but I do think yeah. she's really good and underrated in that movie. All yeah. right. Yeah. Good stuff there. All right. My nominees are Glenn Howerton for his performance in Blackberry. Going mm. to the world of Oppenheimer. There's so many great options to choose from, as Ryan noted. My nominee from Oppenheimer is Bernard himself, David Krumholtz, mm -hmm. in his role good, in Oppenheimer. Good, good stuff. Good stuff. There. Adele Exarchopoulos in the film Wing Women. I love Adele Exarchopoulos. You've mm. never seen her as you see her in that film. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the way you describe that movie to me, it's like, I, I, I should have watched it. I really should have watched it. Absolutely. I got to watch that fun. one. Put it on the, on the letterbox. She was, I just, she's such an eyesore on screen. I know. Just so <laughs> terrible to look at. I know. Uh, but yeah, she's just incredibly magnetic and fun in that film. Zach Efron for The Iron Claw. Great performance his best performance by far, as far yeah. as I'm concerned in the iron claw. And then my last nominee here, Rupert friend for his chapter of the Swan in the Anderson doll shorts. Collectively, mm. I will refer to it all as the wonderful story of Henry sugar, because that it's is one film. The name it's an anthology film. film. It's one film an anthology film. Absolutely. And my winner is Rupert friend and his performance in the Swan. So yeah, he's very good in that, that whole movie in essence, is about the art of adaptation. And when we talked about it here on the show, I said, maybe it's hyperbole, I don't know. But I think his narration in that film is some of the best I've ever heard. I think it is one of the best voiceover narration performances of all time. I, if it, I wins, truly yeah. believe if it wins me over, then it is working because I'm usually not a fan of voiceover narration. The way he is able to slip between characters is phenomenal. It's hysterical. He almost performs it like an audio book, but he's articulating not just his character of Peter Watson, but he's articulating the bullies. He's articulating the overall story, the every character and in, in, in the setting. And he's able to without any rigidness whatsoever, go between these various elements. It is such a strikingly effective uh, performance that is very funny. There's a childlike mentality to it. Mm -hmm. But the more he taps into Peter's troubled experience at the hands of these bullies, the more pathos he gives that whole sequence as well. He fully embraces the tragedy of it all, and it is really felt at the end 
of it, given that last shot and what we see there. It is, it is, it is remarkable. It's Andersonian, of course, in, in some of the very best ways, uh, but the way he's able to balance humor and tragedy, I, it's unbelievable. I, I was jaw dropped with that performance and, and, and the swan. So Rupert friend, as far as I'm concerned, gives one of the best performances of the year and he's my winner. For best and that's, surprise. that's your favorite segment of the, of the four, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's what sure. I thought. Yeah. It's good stuff. Okay. Moving on from there. Let's talk about best surprise <clears throat> movie again, self-explanatory Jay. What do you have for this category? My first nominee is going to be Godzilla minus one, a movie that kind of came out of nowhere later in the year and yeah. set, the world on fire and also made kind of a lot of money in yep. uh, the U S yeah. which was cool. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. I would venture to guess they did not write that film with me specifically in mind. And I kind of, uh, thought about that as I was going into it, but, mm-hmm. um, that just speaks to the power of that film that it spoke to me as much as it did. Uh, sure. someone who has not experienced anything in that film and that's kind of the power of art. So that's neat. Yep. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves, a movie that sounds absolutely stupid on paper. Um, but I don't really know why I doubted those filmmakers because they are incredibly visually inventive. Uh, and as far as comedies are concerned, I don't know that there's anybody doing the stuff that they're doing the way they're doing it. So um, uh, like that one. Poor Things, not a Lanthimos guy. That's probably my favorite Lanthimos. Uh, t- to this point. So wow. I was happy to finally like a Lanthimos. And they clone Tyrone. Again, another one that was kind of buried on Netflix and I really, really enjoyed. But my winner is going to be Dungeons and Dragons just because of how much I liked that film. I hmm. I found myself laughing like so consistently during that. I was surprised. I was enthralled. The practical effects are so exciting. Um, some of the visual sequences are like genuinely very impressive so just from a technical perspective and a comedic perspective in a world where comedy isn't exactly thriving uh that was a real a really pleasant surprise for me this year those guys are going to do a marvel movie soon i, I bet you no marvel's yeah. done yeah Look what they announced today they're not making any more it, <laughs> yeah it's over it's all done you'll find out that duo is yeah. doing something related to that though yeah okay yeah right. okay all right okay um, well, my best surprise nominees are, um, is Ben Affleck's Air. I did not expect to like that movie. I didn't think a movie about a, a, a Michael Jordan shoe would be as good as it was and get Ben Affleck out of the, out of the doldrums of live by night. Um, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. I, I agree. That movie was absolutely surprising and, um, and blew me away in its sincereness. Um, Emma Segelman did not really care for Shiva baby. Uh, but I loved Bottoms, and I thought that that was such a great movie. Equally um, surprised at how much I like Saltburn over uh, over Promising Young Woman. Um, mm. I know I'm the in the minority on that on this on this panel here, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and that's fine. I just think it's a fun own time. It. I, own it. Own I it. I had fun with it. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then Godzilla minus one, which is my winner, um, because. Uh, Holy hell, guys! Uh, they can make good good Godzilla movies. I didn't know that that was possible. Um, and I didn't know they would <laughs> not also in America. Make, I didn't know that they would also make Godzilla movies that would um, on the on the anniversary that would um, uh, totally transcend uh, anything that the Hollywood versions are doing. I mean, like those Hollywood movies are going down like tunnel, uh, like time tunnels and all this uh, other dimensions, and this is just simply keeping it within the aesthetic of essentially world war two and, and mm-hmm. the Japanese. And, and was, I think it's actually a really great comparison or, or not comparison, but a companion to, to Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer and, and a lot of the things there that people seem to wish and want to uh, have explored. Um, and I think it does it in terrifyingly fashion. The, the, the sequences with Godzilla um, are truly terrifying. There's some of the best sound work, but also just some of the most horrific violence you're going to see on screen this year. Um, yeah, I was truly blown away by it. And uh, I, I want to see more, more Godzilla movies like this, please. Yeah, it's why it's a nominee for me, as well as Bottoms. You mentioned two films there that are nominees for me for Best Surprise Movie. I also have The Color Purple, which I didn't expect to like as much as I did. Uh, Scream 6, I actually think, is a very good Scream film. 
And my last nominee for Best Surprise Movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. All right. <laughs> Which... <laughs> The more I think about it, it, might be the best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie ever. So uh, I guess that, that's that's saying something. Ooh, but I'm, that's a I'm good with question. I mean, I have such a nostalgic tie to that first one from 19. I think the first one is genuinely one. pretty good. I, yeah, agree. I agree. I agree. Those are the two that I'll go back and forth on. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it's it's Mutant Mayhem. I, I it's it's a better movie. It has more things on its mind that I kind of have to give it more credit in that regard. It just doesn't have the nostalgia factor for me. Yeah. Um, I'm with Ryan, though. Uh, Godzilla Minus One is my winner here, simply because why can't blockbusters do more of this? And what was the budget on this movie? 15 million? 15 million. Yeah. Something yeah. unfathomable when you watch yeah. it. Incredible. And you, Astonishing. Multiply, you multiply that budget by, I don't know, like 20, which mirrors many American blockbusters nowadays, and those movies look so much worse. It's ju yeah. It's just incredible. It's an incredible yeah. achievement in that regard, which is why I feel the urge to give it this type of award uh, because I, yeah. I I think it needs to represent what blockbusters need to do better, at least here in America. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good pick. Brendan, I can love I, it. No, go uh, ahead. JD, do you mind if I just say one thing real quick yeah, to, yeah. to Brendan's point? Yeah. So this new Godzilla you're saying is $15 million, right? I th yeah, 20, I think it is. The, the 2014 version of Godzilla from Gar or Gar what is that? Gareth Edwards? Gareth Edwards, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a $160 million budget. I want that. And Gareth in, Edwards, Gareth that Edwards is actually a good user, utilizer of budgets yeah, it's too. On the I mean, the, no, the creator, it is. Like, yeah. looks amazing yeah. no, it for is, but, its budget, but but it's incredibly it is, astonishing. Yeah. It's interesting to even say those, like Gareth Edwards is a guy probably, who squeezes every dollar out of it. Yeah. and this is like above. But those, mo but those yeah. Hollywood budgets increased. You know what I mean? They yeah. have to yeah. increase. Yeah. And yeah. this movie is at fifteen million dollars is better than any of them. Just any yeah. of them. It might be yeah. right up there with the original in that case. So yeah, it makes you wonder where that money's going. If they can do this on fifteen million, I mean, the answer is mostly actors. Yeah, it's got to be yeah, right. Actors. And the yeah. and, and then you add in the marketing and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, wow. Good craft Absolutely services. Wild. That's all I guess. <laughs> gotta get those. Craft no, but it services. really is. It really is a lot of garbage like that. Where it's just like, where is this yeah. money going? Oh, we threw it in a fire. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much yeah the amount of we sunk just, costs that probably go into american filmmaking nowadays is just unfathomable yeah. yeah it's it's insane all right my nominees for best surprise movie i will also include godzilla minus one as you guys talked about i had adele exarchopolis in the previous category but i'm gonna go with melanie laurent's wing women the film as a whole was one mm -hmm. of the more fun experiences of the year for me similarly to godzilla minus one you can do a lot with a little my other three nominees here. Fallen Leaves, Aki Kurismaki. I agree with everything mm -hmm. you guys said about it earlier. Really great movie. Big surprise for me. M. Night Shyamalan's Knock at the Cabin is still one of my favorite films of the year. And my last nominee here is Wim Wenders' new film, Perfect Days. Mm -hmm. And that is actually going to be my winner. I was with you guys. I had Godzilla Minus One as my winner for this category up until about a week ago when I saw Perfect Days. And I'm not sure what it is. Perhaps it's the Wim Wenders of it all, a director I love, but I don't know if he's done anything noteworthy in a while that I can recall. It has know, been a while. It's been yeah. it's been a minute. And then also, there wasn't much surrounding this film. It's thrown into the neon box that you get at the end of the year. There are a few reviews, of course, out there you know, from when this played at certain festivals over the fall. But yeah. there yeah. hasn't been much discourse around this film other than it's good. You should check it out. And so, of course, I want to fit it in before we do the award show. And I was blown away by it, blown away by it. It's it's mm -hmm. an incredible mm -hmm. film that I, I, I just did not expect to resonate with it the way I did. It's yeah. premise and structure is remarkably simple. There's a redundancy to it that often can feel like a criticism, but somehow in that film it's a vital part of its charm mm -hmm. uh, there's something about watching the routine of this guy that is so delightful and heartwarming especially thanks to koji yakusho's performance it's yeah for sure astonishing so yeah perfect days is my winner for best surprise movie of the year i think it goes wide sometime this month i think it's in a yeah. couple days as we're recording this a couple perfect days mm -hmm. from now a couple wow. perfect days from now. that's almost yeah, unfair jd because you're you've always really been into toilet culture 
I, I don't know. So it just feels like <laughs> something that... Yeah. This episode really brought you by <laughs> Scrub Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Gotta say, the company he works for, the Tokyo Toilet, it just, yeah. that just that rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? You know, I gotta tell you... Yeah. It says everything shout in the out, name. Shout out to the vending machine company for always having that coffee ready to go for him in the morning. So. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. No yeah. mishaps. So always, no mishaps. They're always stocked. They're, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well I done. I don't know, follow well, that guy stuck. around. It's you just, know what I mean? I will say that bathroom that is transparent and then becomes not so when you lock it is terrifying. That could be a, a scene for a horror scene of the year for me. I would never walk into that thing. Uh, but it's Japanese bathrooms are weird. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a little strange. But anyway, yeah. love that movie. <laughs> Moving on to the next category. Best overlooked movie of 2023. Jay, what do you got for this category? Yeah, so we'll start with the movie that, J.D., you and I actually reviewed uh, on the podcast, uh, Master mm-hmm. Gardener, the, oh, the Paul Schrader film that's sort of just been kind of tossed aside over the last several months. Good the Guy you. Ritchie film, The Covenant. Again, my beloved Guy Ritchie. He's my number one favorite director of all time. Um, uh, not quite, but uh, I, I do like <laughs> uh, You Hurt My Feelings uh, is a film that I feel like the people who have seen it have really liked it, but not enough yeah. people have seen it. Uh, Rye Lane is a, a Hulu film yeah. that really yeah. kind of surprised me. I, I, I easily could have put this in surprise movie, but talk about visually inventive comedy. This thing is like uh, alarmingly inventive um, stylistically. So I uh, really like that one. And finally, The Burial, which seems like a complete throwaway of a movie, but lo and behold, Jamie Foxx came in and did like, two tomahawk three sixty slam dunks in every scene to make it one of the best performances of the year uh and make that movie For sure so watchable like so I, I that was a great couple hours i spent watching that movie but my winner is going to be rye lane kind of came out of nowhere and uh has i i've not heard hardly anybody talk about that movie uh so yeah. i urge everybody to go and check out rye lane such an yeah. inventive yeah rom- it's pretty movie. good it's yeah. pretty good like yeah it. Yeah, good little movie out of Sundance. Um, yeah, um, my my nominees are uh, the Christian Petzl film A Fire. That it seems like every year this man mm-hmm. makes a movie, or every other year this man makes a movie, and nobody's talking about it. And it just, I know, it just. I, I, I always get so to his films later than I would care to admit. This is yeah. one I still haven't seen yet. Sadly, it, it, it I saw it n- earlier today. Oh, okay, there you go. We should just call this the Christian Petzold ever- award. Best overlooked <laughs> award. He, he gets nominated. It's because it, it, it got bought by Criterion. So they yeah, botched yeah, the yeah. distribution of it. I mean, that's yeah. what true. Why? Um, I mentioned this. Uh, I mentioned her in um, in my best discovery this year, but uh, Raven Jackson's All Dirt Rose Tastes Assault. A movie called Memory with uh, Jessica mm-hmm. Chastain and Peter Sarsgaard. Uh, mm-hmm. I know it's slowly getting out there, but um, the screeners were sent out, so everybody had a chance to see it. Uh, the Royal Hotel, which um, is Kitty Green's uh, follow-up to The Assistant, yeah, yeah, um, was it was a movie that I I saw Tell You Right, and I, I really liked that film, and um, I think Kitty Green's very effective in terms of uh, tone and being able to set uh, tension. And uh, and my last one is uh, Ava DuVernay's Origin, uh, which is a movie that um, mm-hmm. even critics. Haven't even been able to get the chance to see um, because of the just botchedness by Neon. Yeah, they messed and, that one up. Big they time. really messed that. They one had up. no idea what kind of movie. That, they that's had another already. one that's yeah. not even released as far as when we're recording this. I think that's no, no, this month. No. Yeah, and it's 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 driven me nuts because no one is talking about it, and yet it's a really really special film for me. It's a very interesting yeah. one. It, whether you like the film or not, it's going to spark conversation. Very yes, very, I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it's I actually think it's her best work to date so far. Oh wow. Um, really? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I wouldn't go yeah. that far, but I think it's her most talking or like the one that stimulates yeah. the most conversation. Yeah. For, sure. for me, her talking. definitely very confident from her. And yeah. Um, oh, yeah. you know, I I I'm going to go with Raven Jackson's All Dirt Rose Taste Assault. And this is a movie that uh, I saw at Sundance uh, virtually and I fell in love with it. I'm usually more, not a more of the aesthetic guy. That's more Jay. He likes the aesthetics of things that I'm more story driven. Uh, but I fell in love with the way that this movie uses sort of the, the visual language to tell this, uh, to tell this really personal story. That's got a lot to do with uh Jackson's own upbringing uh, within uh, the South. And so 
I don't know. Yeah. It's just a movie that's it's, it's like it's it's on VOD and people haven't seen it and it really didn't even get theatrical run and A24. Yeah. They have a mil- A24 is notorious for this. They got a million movies that they release and you really could have put five A24 films here essentially and their big ones get pushed like Zone of Interest or Past Lives but yeah. this one goes under the yeah. radar and it's one that I think is really special and people should check out. That's an interesting talking point because pretty much any time an A24 film doesn't quite get the same number of legs as another one of their films, it gets really lost in their marketing shuffle. Like yeah. They're, yeah. they're really bad at prioritizing the, the the films that they seem as maybe less When you get uh, a batch grabbing. of screeners and it's in there and you're like, wait, Y'all, y- y'all remembered that this was one of your movies? Okay, cool. <laughs> I, right. I didn't even know it was an A24 film until you started talking about it. But it, there, it, I mean, th- there is yeah. uh, an overarching point with how A24 treats all of their films that they acquire each yeah. year because th- they, they, they like to play favorites with the ones that they feel most confident in. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely another case of that here. Um, they don't have Disney money, Brendan. We have to, no, but they uh, want oh, yeah, that they, Disney yeah, money. They, 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 want they, they, they want those gave IPs. They just gave Alex Garland them. who knows how much money for that Civil War movie that looks so smart. Yeah. I mean, like, like guys, so it's not intellectually. I mean, listen, the guy that made Men is making a movie about our divided country. Come okay, on. who's not there? Uh, Sounds like an range. early candidate for the <laughs> Adam McKay Award. You know? What do they do? But they're I doing like... a. They're doing a. What, what's the? What's the? What's the video game they're doing the the movie for now? Oh, uh, I don't. Know. I don't know. New, new I, era I, of a twenty four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, forget. I forget. Anyway, I, I have um, it. I own it. I've played it. I don't know. Whatever. It's it's something okay. I I know what you're talking about. I just forget what it's called. Um, best overlook movies for me. I've got The Burial is one of my nominees. I also have You Hurt My Feelings and a few other ones here. Uh, this has been a great year for foreign language films. And I also have The Eight Mountains listed here, which I feel like not enough people are talking about. One of the best looking films of the year. Uh, Flora and Son, a new film from John Carney. No one's really talking about. It kind of got buried by Apple TV. I think the movie's pretty good. I don't think it's great, but I think it's pretty good. Uh, and there's a new film from Kelly Reichard, Showing Up. You know, just yeah. the idea that Clay Record has another a new H- film out. Yeah, another. <laughs> so I another guess the, movie. <laughs> the theme continues, doesn't it? Um, my winner here, I'm actually going to give it to You Hurt My Feelings simply because I actually think it's one of the better written films of the year. I don't think we're talking about it enough. Uh, Nicole Holoff Center. Uh, uh, I think that's how you pronounce your last name. Uh, Hol- Hol- Center. Holoff Center. Yeah. Center. Okay. Nicole Holoff Center's work there, I think, is really stimulating i think it's going to spark conversation for sure and i think it has a lot of interesting ideas i think it's one of the better written films of the year so for that reason i think the movie is very much overlooked uh and we're talking a lot about great writers this year a lot of newcomers a lot of veterans in the game and i think nicole needs to be part of that conversation too so you hurt my feelings i think a very underappreciated film in that regard a24 yeah (laughs) another a24 all right we're on to something guys yeah all right, my nominees for Best Overlooked Movie include Showing Up, Kelly Reichardt. I very much agree there. I also have Hinnor Palmason's Godland. This is another one of those that was bought by Criterion. It went straight yeah. to the Criterion channel yep. when it yeah. was released. But phenomenal movie. I have Iris X Passages. This came out in August. I, I want to say there was at least some buzz leading up to its release, but it's a, mo- just it's a movie hasn't been mm-hmm. talked about since, but one of the best movies of the year, these last two nominees for me, I think are overlooked because of how dismissed they've been. One of them hasn't been circulated quite as much. So maybe I can be a little bit fair here, but it, the discourse is still, you know, qualifies under dismissive. And that is on hung Tron's, the taste of things. This is a film that France selected. So this is, it falls under the whole awards discourse that I sometimes quite loathe, but it's not anatomy of a fall. So people are immediately dismissive of it, but there is an (laughs) argument to be made that the taste of things is as good as anatomy of a fall. If not better, I'll raise my hand. I like it more. It is very, (laughs) very good. Is Uh, everyone raising their hands? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Oh, there you go. So it's and I really like Anatomy of a Fall as well. In fact, as we're recording this, didn't it just win Best Screenplay at the Golden Globes? Anatomy of a Fall just did. So yeah, I mean, the taste of things is not in the awards conversation. It 
won't be nominated for an Oscar, most likely. I don't know. Maybe it makes Best International Film. Who it's, knows? It's probably going to make International Feature, J.D. Okay. Well, either way, it's not quite in the in the conversation like Anatomy of a Fall is. Um, but, again, it's still just as good. And then my last nominee here, similarly, I think Wes Anderson has been dismissed this year. And my final nominee here is The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, the yeah. ball shorts. And that's actually my winner. I think 2023 was a defining year for Wes Anderson. This is a filmmaker that I already love and adore. And I think we are watching this artist evolve right in front of our eyes. There is a maturity, a sophistication to his features this year mm-hmm. that I don't know if he could have made 10 years ago. I don't think he would have been able to do it with the prowess he does. Um, I, yeah, I he's love Asteroid sure. City. I'll, I'll certainly talk about that later. But I think these shorts, as an anthology film, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar is some of the best work he's ever done. Yeah. It's, it's an astounding depiction of the art of adaptation, a fascinating experiment in narration and storytelling, and how he frames his actors, how they address the camera directly, serving as narrators, obviously. It's as diverting as it is thoughtful and poignant. Sure. Um, I love how he works with Dahl's writing. It's almost verbatim, although he condenses it a little bit. And there's something about that, uh, with Dahl's writing, that is, that divinely complements the Dollhouse aesthetic and his quirky sensibilities. Uh, but beyond all of that, it's, it's how he plays and toys with the art of narration uh, that I find seductive. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, a cinematic achievement that very few, I think, have been able to match as far as anthology films goes. And the connective tissue of it all as it relates to transformation, whether it be good or bad, there comes a point every single one of those shorts where something shifts and the story takes a completely new turn and we're forced to wrestle with the story and the characters in a new and delightful way that I quite love. So. I feel like the theme with this whole category is distributors that botched their respective films yeah, Netflix releases. Is very much. Uh, yeah, it is. It's Netflix Criterion movie, A24. If it's not one of their yeah. like top three priorities. Yeah. But uh, but in this case, like yeah. like the idea of releasing all four of these shorts as separate shorts on Netflix, like, that idea just baffles me. Yeah. Like this, this really should have been a collective singular yeah. experience. It was made that yeah, way. Yeah, he just you did wa- it with you French Dispatch. Him, yeah. yeah. You watch him, you see the connective tissue, you feel the connective tissue. He clearly made those shorts to be watched as an anthology film. Uh, yeah. To me, there's no debate about it. And Netflix was like, well, <laughs> we're going to completely... Uh, if, if Wes Anderson wanted that to be a movie, I think he could have made it a movie. I think, I think that Wes did. Anderson... I have no doubt wanted, about that. I think Wes Anderson wants an Oscar. And I think he split it up into five so that he can finally get oh, one interesting. in the short category. And I don't have mm-hmm. a problem with it whatsoever because this man should probably have like two or three already. So. <laughs> I mean, if, if that's his priority, <laughs> then... let's play the game, folks. All right. <laughs> then let's get, let's get, let's get Wes Anderson Ryan, and Brian, Brian Cooper in a room. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan coming in being super cynical. Never. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is Boy, very Jason. particular about his releases. Like every movie he makes, he stipulates this is going to go on Criterion. Uh, and then, I mean, he, he is very particular about how his stuff gets released. I can't imagine that was not his will for those to be released separately, but, uh, maybe, maybe yeah. it wasn't. I don't know. May, I don't know. I, I obviously we don't know. We don't, unless we ask him directly, but mm-hmm. if that, w- if that were his intent to release him that way, I would just say, Hey, you're a great artist, man, but I respectfully disagree with your choice here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if the Oscar is the motive Again, I have no yeah. problem giving awards to Wes Anderson. Please do so by all means. I'm, out, yeah. I'm very much Man's okay with that. Right but I, I mean, you watch those, and it's very clear they were meant to be viewed together. And so I, and so I will, I will argue that I will stand by that, mm-hmm. die on that hill. However, roll Dollhouse, roll yeah. Dollhouse. I love it exactly. Um, all right. Moving on to the next category. This is one of my very favorites that we do. This is best opening or closing scene or sequence. Could be the beginning of a film. Could be the end of a film. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, the way a film opens or closes can obviously have a, a severe impact on the film's overall quality. So I love that we highlight it. Again, it's one of my favorites. Jay, what do you have as your five nominees? Yeah, I always find this to be one of the most stressful uh, uh, set of nominees put together. Uh, but also one of the most fun, like you said. Uh, I've got, so mm-hmm. let me just start with two where I have both bookends. I have the beginning and the end of Killers of the Flower Moon, the opening uh, credit sequence, which I think mm-hmm. is so evocative and visceral and like mm-hmm. visually dazzling. And then the Martin Scorsese final radio play scene, which is yeah. kind of indicative of everything that he's looking uh, to explore at this point in his career. Mm-hmm. And the other one that I have bookends for is Oppenheimer, which has the the raindrops and then the... Mm. bomb uh yeah. in the clouds sequences uh, at the at the end of that film i also have the awful movie at the end of may december which is kind of the uh tar <laughs> of 2023 <laughs> so good yeah yeah uh i have the 2001 opening of barbie yeah that's good and i have the final scene of past lives which has been talked about to death and is just so heartbreaking uh mm-hmm. and evocative but I'm going to go with the pretty simple opening and closing shots of Oppenheimer, which to me kind of say every the yeah. dichotomy between those two shots, yeah. the connectivity is sort of just talking about everything that that movie is trying to talk about and in very simple terms lays out the... Yeah, and uh, Jay has a lot of crossover with uh, with myself here, actually. Um, I have the, the closing... Uh, sequence in Oppenheimer, the I believe we did seen by the lake uh, with yeah. Oppenheimer and Einstein. Uh, the radio show with Killers of the Flower Moon um, is definitely there. The it's getting more real closing in uh, May December. Um, uh, I have the staircase closing sequence in the zone of interest, um, and a, a, a scene that I. I I, yeah, it's played in my head mm, way too many mm. times. And for an opening sequence, I mean, there's no better opening sequence than the opening meal being prepared in the taste of things. Yeah, that's um, very and good. Mm-hmm. You yeah. cannot watch that on an empty stomach. If if you do, you will be rushed to the hospital, um, and they'll need to give you nourishment. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm going with I'm I'm going with uh, the radio show in Killers of the Flower Moon. I mm, think okay. that it is. Uh, seeing the film three times, I think it's the most profound uh, bit about it, and it's most fascinating about it too. About like how an artist injects themselves into a conversation that maybe necessarily they shouldn't be allowed by some people in their estimation to talk about. But I think Scorsese has always done this. He's always put himself and put his curiosities as a filmmaker, as every filmmaker should, into the film. And I think that it's only right then by that last moment for him to be the one to read yeah. about Molly's of you know ultimate just ending and then that that isn't the end of it and that's not just the most curious thing is then it transitions to the osage now strong yeah Yeah. and through all of this tragedy and it's a profound final shot of that aerial and i've had the pleasure of sitting in a q a and listening to chris as you talk about how that was just on a, a, a will of the moment, like spur of the moment sort of thing where they just, they decided to do it. And when he did it, he was like, that has to be the final shot. There's no question yeah, about it. Makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, and they all kind of broke down on the set. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely love yeah. that sequence. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's fantastic. One of my scenes of the year. I yeah. completely agree. Yeah. Good it's stuff. great. It's great stuff. I feel, I feel like I'm the one that always uses this category to talk about something maybe a little bit different. A lot of times we tend to focus on scenes and some of those effective scenes that either bookend a film, begin or end a film. But I like to focus on the credits sequences themselves. Uh, so I guess I'm looking at because I feel like that's an art that we sometimes don't talk enough about is the is what the credit sequence is, which is why my nominees here. I've got the opening and closing credits of Eileen, the film Eileen, uh, a film okay. I don't care for, but I like the style of those opening and closing credits. I've got the opening title rise from Evil Dead Rise, a film I don't like at all, but I love that title. Yeah, I like that too. I love the way that literally comes up. The opening flower credits from Master Gardener I think are really interesting and evocative. Um, Really, the opening credit sequence itself for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and how it starts, what, like 20 to 30 minutes into the film? 
It just like yeah. it drops so long. It's got the longest prologue of the entire year. Um, and my last nominee here, I'm a sucker for good nostalgia. I think the nostalgic opening closing credit sequences of Peter Pan and Wendy are very effective. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's another one of those. Do you remember that came out this year? <laughs> first and last time, David Peter Lowry. Pan and Wendy will be mentioned this evening. <laughs> I don't think even David Lowry remembers that he made that movie. I was so disappointed in that. He was building that one up so much. It's probably the best film he has made yet, and it's not that. Sadly, yeah. not that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there was potential there, unfortunately. Um, my winner is going to be Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and it's not even just the opening credits that start, what, 20 minutes into the movie, which I think is a really great tone setter for that entire experience but the closing credits themselves are very artful that last title drop is kind of a barn burner in a lot of ways so uh just the artistic integrity of the credit sequences themselves in that movie mm -hmm. prove how it's just not a lost art anymore so many movies like yeah. to forego it and just save the title drop for the end of the film and that's all they do and while it might work for some films i like when movies kind of take charge and do something creative with who actually made the movie and really showcase that so yeah spider-man across the spider-verse i think is really inventive in that regard yeah great stuff i love how different this is for brendan <laughs> always bring some unique hey we call it this. best opening or closing credit sequence yeah, or scene sure. so i'm they just do. not yeah. using the scene literally yeah that's good stuff all right as far as my nominees go i do have one opening here but my god i thought it was one hell of a year for closing scenes. I could have had 10 different nominees for this. I thought the depth was fantastic for this category. My nominees are, I'm with Jay. I think the opening to Barbie is quite fantastic. So that's a nominee for me here. The ending to Oppenheimer, I also have as a nominee here, the ending to Past Lives. And then my final two, the closing scene in the zone of interest will haunt me for quite a long time. Yeah. And then that final shot, that ending shot in perfect days is quite mm. fantastic. So those are my five nominees. I don't need to spend too much time here because I talked about it in depth on last week's show when we did best yeah. scenes of the year. But the closing scene to past lives is my winner for this category it might as well be a one a to Oppenheimer mm -hmm. though. I feel like those two scenes are my, or like more like a one, a one B situation for sure. The past lives. The, the closing to that film is stunning to me in the sense that it it's, it has this tender, quiet, introspective uh, approach to it, which I tend to love in movies as it is. But I do love the verbal exchanges there between Nora and Haesung. You have these two characters that have have had to confront the reality of their lives as it relates to the both of them and what their relationship is. And they have to find some closure despite them arguably not being willing participants, which is what I love so much about the cut. I talked about that last week. There's an edit that mm -hmm. Sling Song has here where we go back to them as as children yeah. where they're equally not willing participants in, in them separating. But now as adults, they are aware of the stakes aware that they have to find some sort of closure, even if they don't want to, which is what makes that goodbye. So heartbreaking where high sung gets in, he, he asks her about being something in their next life. Nora doesn't have an answer to it. She's just like, I don't know. And he leaves and she walks away and you see her start to unravel there in front of her husband. Like that added element, I just think adds a sophistication and uh, a, a vulnerability to the character that is astonishing to me. I absolutely love it. So, uh, yeah, the ending to past lives will soon not forget. That's JD, you have, to stop, you have to stop talking about it because I'm going to start crying because I'm visualizing <laughs> so it in my head. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've cried way too much this year at these movies. I know. And that's such a beautiful moment in that. Cry, movie. baby. Gorgeous. And, yeah. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Real, okay. men. Real men cry in movies. Make I that a shirt, JD. Yeah, now we need a shirt for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of shirts. So I better get yeah. some money off of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, all right, moving on to the next category. This is best use of soundtrack music. As Brennan noted at the top of the show, this can be original or pre-existing. We love a good needle drop. Yeah. Either counts here. Uh, so, Jay, what do you have as your five nominees? Yeah, this is always one of my favorites. Uh, my first nominee is going to be a song called Le Monde from the movie Talk to Me. It's mm-hmm. uh, in this very like energetic montage sequence when they're kind of all partying it's just far and away i think the best sequence of that film which i think is overall okay but that sequence is really kind of captures the energy that i wish that whole movie had um the i will always love you dolly parton version from priscilla i think is one of the best moments of the year uh i think actually one of priscilla's greatest assets is that it doesn't have the licensing rights to the elvis music yep. agreed. Um, agreed i think sophia agreed. coppola takes full advantage of that mm-hmm. um the push sequence from barbie uh one of the funniest moments of the year you talk about one of the funniest moments best laugh moments in your earlier category jd that was one of mine for sure yeah uh how about the entire soundtrack of the killer the smiths the smiths <laughs> that, yeah that's good yeah the idea of that uh is one of the best kind of ideas that anybody had for a uh, music this year, but my winner is actually going to be the utilization of the original Godzilla theme in Godzilla minus one. That's a good okay. point. Anytime mm-hmm. that shows up in the movie, it sent chills down my spine. Just dun 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 Just so well, I like Jay's cover thrilling. of it. <laughs> yeah, so so good. And I kept thinking of what's that rap song that used that beat? I can't remember. But there was one oh, time at the end time. in the battleship it's like dun 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 dun. I was like, Oh, they're gonna do it. Here it comes. And obviously they were never going to, but it, it, it crossed my mind a couple times. How would you feel if they actually did do that? Would that have taken you out of the movie? <sighs> would have been the best in that movie particular of... movie, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes the best move of any movie this year yeah. would have been the number one movie of the year. Then I think what I love about the use of it, though, in that film is you hear that th- that melody that Jay was mimicking there, and it's it's a little bit of a slow build the first couple times you hear it, and then you get to that final action beat at the end where it goes full bore into the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And if you're not standing up and, and applauding and cheering, I don't I don't know what you're doing. It's yeah. it's incredible. So good. Um right. okay. Um I have a lot of different uh ones than Jay. Other only that, uh I do agree. I have I have a song from from Barbie, but I uh, it's one of the original songs. Okay. Um I have uh Dance the Night Away from Dua Lipa, which I think mm. not only is utilized i think the best of all the songs and of the cast but it has one of my favorite moments in the film where it's ryan gosling's pouty face getting onto the dance floor and doing the dance moves absolutely that just hilarious um and then also i i have a, a track from the killer um from that was of the smiths it's how soon is now from um okay. and, and that is of course right when he's trying to um um do to pull off the first hit um then the other two needle drops i have are uh last train to san fernando which is used during the opening credit sequence there for wes anderson's asteroid city um if that didn't put a biggest smile on my face right and right into asteroid city i don't know what did it's typical west just being able to pull some some yeah. like song that it like feels like out of a only time in which he can bring that into and i love it yeah yeah um the the power of love if frankie goes to hollywood and all of us strangers mm-hmm. um just thinking about that uh, you might want to cry uh it's okay we'll talk <laughs> about it later um and then the only uh, the other original song i ha- have on here and my winner is live that way forever from iron claw and it's yeah. not necessarily the way it's used in the credits though you, you want to use that version you can but in the film yeah. it is it is used right before right before um uh all the tragedies and everything start to hit and it's the actual uh, performance of it from i think it was the brother mike is the one that yes. performs is that when you're talking from, about yeah. yes and it's an encapsulation of everything obviously that that that's going to lead up to that with the family and whatnot and i i it just that moment there of them having that one last or one of the only last times we'll all be together and they feel like they are riding high 
um, only for the, that family to fall down. I mean, it's 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 an incredibly moving moment, um, and uh, and yeah, it's a pretty darn good little song as well too. So that movie's yeah. good at using music. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is mm-hmm. very good at using music. I have the Iron Claws a nominee for me. I didn't include Live That Way Forever, which is by the film's composer Richard Reed Perry, as well as Little Scream, I believe the folk artist. Correct. That's what Correct. she goes by. Um, it, all my, Because I think the, the year has been so strong for needle drops specifically that aren't songs written specifically for their respective films. I wanted to focus on the needle drops themselves more than anything else, but the Iron Claw has a wonderful needle drop of Tom Sawyer by Rush. Uh, making for one of the best montages of the year. So I have that as a nominee for me. I have The Power of Love by Frankie Goes to Hollywood from All the Strangers, another nominee for me. I agree with you there, Ryan. Uh, September by Earth, Wind, and Fire from Robot Dreams. Um, Tyrone by Erica Badu from the movie They Clone Tyrone, which is oh, that one I kind of want to pick as my winner, even though I haven't, because it's just such an interesting anomaly for a song that's kind of existing in this space as being both a needle drop and an original song for this movie because the song originally came out in 1997, but she came back and re sang some of the lyrics to fit the movie. They clone Tyrone, which is really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. Um, so again, Tyrone from Erica Badu, another nominee for me, my winner. And I won't go too far into this because I talked about it a lot during our best scenes of the year, but Nina Simone's feeling good, which closes the film. Perfect days. The Wim Wenders film is my winner here for best use of soundtrack. I think it's really powerful stuff. One of the best scenes of the year and one of the best performances of the year, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit as this award show keeps going. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to also highlight, I don't know if it's a nominee for you, JD, so I don't want to jump the gun too much, but for how great this year of needle drops have been, I do want to give an honorable mention for one that just missed my five. I did not care for the movie, the creator all that much, the Gareth Edwards film, but there is a drop of Radiohead's everything in its right. Absolutely. So I at least want to highlight that this was a really great year for just simply music in general in mm-hmm. movies and how they're utilized. But anyway, feeling good by Nina Simone and perfect days is still my winner. To the okay. point of Brendan talking about Erica Badu re-recording lyrics, I do want to say that EMF did record their song Unbelievable for the commercial for Crumb Believable, which I think is a, a similar instance of that happening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for noting that. What the hell is going on? You like that is believable. <laughs> Remember that one? No. Oh, <laughs> JD, what? kind of anecdote is like good lord <laughs> we have now made a full transition to commercials we're an hour and a half in and i don't know they're regretting bringing about. us back ryan <laughs> where are we now gonna, i'm doing fine say, right i don't know about you that energy back to the show <laughs> god i love it i've yeah, lost my place for Bo. Uh, okay my nominees for best use of soundtrack music i have dear alien from the cast of asteroid city Oh, Feeling good, Nina Simone. The ending scene to Perfect Days. Gotta love it. Uh, September, Earth, Wind, and Fire from the film Robot Dreams. Love that one. This is probably going to surprise many. But I'm my next nominee here is, this is a long title, Why May I Not Go Out and Climb the Trees? This is from Daniel Norgren from the film The Eight Mountains. The song, a motif that plays throughout that film that I feel like fits the tone and aesthetic of that film impeccably. Uh, it's a great use of folk music that I love in general, but as far as use of music goes, I'd say that one is, it's it's one of the best of the year, hands down. And look, as much as I love Barbie, some great uses of music in that film. But my last nominee here, I like it better than anything in Barbie. Jack Black, Peaches. It's okay. Peaches, Peaches, Peaches. It's okay. Super Mario Brothers. It's okay. And you can uh, have that since one. that is the objective best selection. Stop using that <laughs> word. <laughs> we seriously need to stop using that word. <laughs> oh my God. You, you we need to stop calm down. I'm just trying to have a little fun here. Relax, my man. We're having some fun. We're so enjoying. We're celebrating. Oh so my! These are my nominees. So I'm you trying don't to have, have some fun. It's okay. Relax. It's okay. Calm down. <laughs> Love me some Jack Black. Always having a lot of fun. Anytime he performs that, I could watch the TikTok a thousand times over. Uh, but my winner for this, all joking aside, is Earth, Wind, and Fire September in Robot Great Dreams. Stuff. 
Uh, this is an incredible use of this song. I mean, the first time yeah. we hear it and how it embodies the the friendship between robot and dog, it's so endearing to watch. And it's something that, that bonds them together, which is why when it's brought back later on in the film without getting into spoilers, uh, the way that song is utilized, it's, it, I love the dichotomy of it being as heartbreaking as it is. <laughs> Um, lovable and heartwarming all at the same time. It's it's such a, an impeccable use of that music uh, that I, I just fits that world in, immaculately. I love it. So mm-hmm. yeah, great song, but especially utilized to perfection in that film. So that yeah. is my winner. Great September. stuff. Great First stuff. Moon and fire. All right, moving on to my favorite category: best original score. All right, Jay, what do you got? Oh man, we're under the Oscar categories now. Yeah, we are. Uh, so my nominees for best score are, are Ludwig Göransson for Oppenheimer, Joe Hisaishi, the legend for uh, The Boy and the Heron, Daniel Pemberton for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the late Robbie Robertson for Killers of the Flower Moon, and Marcelo Zarvos for May, December, and which is just such like a wonderfully ironic score. I think that's a really special, specific piece of work. Uh, but my winner is going to be Ludwig Göransson for Oppenheimer. I think just so propulsive. I think that is a huge asset to that film. Propulsive is kind of the number one word I think of when I think about Oppenheimer. For a movie about people talking in rooms, it feels like it goes a mile a minute. And I would say the two biggest contributing factors to that are the editing and the Göransson score. So uh, I'm going to give it to Göransson for this one. I'm almost positive I've given it to him for other films on these awards in the past. So uh, congratulations to multi-time winner <laughs> Ludwig Göransson. I, I, I think you gave it to him for Tenant. I'm sure I did because that <laughs> score is probably even the better. The Ludwig Göransson Award yes. goes to um, yes. I have I have Ludwig Göransson nominated as well for Oppenheimer. I think it's a wonderful work by him. Uh, and I also have Joe uh, Hisaishi for The Boy and the Heron. I mean. What can you say about that score? Daniel Pemberton as well, also for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I have Christopher Bear and Daniel Rosen for Past Lives. And I have Michael Levy for The Zone of Interest. Yeah. Talk about just a score that is viscerally uh, a part of it. I think all five of these scores are just some of the mm-hmm. best of the year. Yeah. Um, I, I, Jay, I, I was with you probably until the last week on Gorenson. And I do think it's, it's going to probably be the one that ends up winning the Oscar. But for me, mm-hmm. uh, I, I couldn't stop thinking about Christopher bear and Daniel Rose score in past lives, and particularly in the, in one. that third yeah. act and, and just how every time I, I, I listen to that score and I think back to that scene that JD, you beautifully talked about, and the moments in that movie where it has just this beautiful elegance to it, that score is really carrying and championing a lot of those moments. And so, and it's a real damn shame that the shortlist did not include it. And so it does not have the opportunity to get nominated for an Oscar because I think it's some of the best work uh, ranked up with uh, all four of these other nominees that um, have the chance to get nominated. And so, um. Yeah, I just think it's beautiful work, and I could have given it to all of them. I could have given yeah. it to Gorenson, who's. I mean, that's that is like the most score, but it's also like so yeah, exactly. damn good. It's, it's and the I've easy listened one to, to it, give it to, and I get, and, yeah. and 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 I love it so much. I have it on vinyl, and I listen to it all the time. Um, and Pemberton score too. That is <clears> so <throat> much of that movie. Like Brendan, mm-hmm. you were talking about the opening of like when Gwen's on the drums and everything that. And how that all builds up into then even the the you know the end. Oh, I love it all. And so, uh, but past lives has has my winner here. Yeah, good stuff. I think at the very least we can say that past lives is maybe the most underappreciated score of the year. At least One given the way that the sure. award circuits are talking about some of Absolutely. the best music. Yeah, uh, this is where I think <laughs> we might be a little boring as far as offering some new opinions on what we think some of the best scored <laughs> movies of the year are. My nominees yeah. are Christopher Bear and Daniel Rosen for Past Lives, Lobig Gorenson for Oppenheimer, Joe Hisaishi for The Boy and the Heron, Daniel Pemberton for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'll add one little difference here, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of the this late composer's name, but 
uh, Ryuki Sakamoto from Monster, who recently just passed away. Uh, so that'll be my last nominee here. My heart wants to give it to Joe Saishi because I just want to see him win something. But my head keeps telling me, is it really the best score of the year, The Boy and the Heron? It's certainly one of them. Uh, and they, it might even be my number two, if I'm being honest. But I got to give it to Ludwig Gornson. I, I just I think it is the best score of the year. I genuinely do. And you know a score is great yeah. when you listen to a track like, what was it called, JD? Uh, can you hear the music? I think the track yeah. name is. When I first heard that, my reaction was, okay, what piece of classical music is he pulling from for this? No, that's an original piece of music. And you know a score is good yeah. when you mistaken it for pre-existing classical music from you know the classical era. Uh, so for that reason, I think uh, what Logan Gordonson is doing is just on a different level. So uh, I'll leave it at that because I think we're going to be talking about not just him, but the film Oppenheimer in general as one of the technical achievements of the year. Uh, but I do think the score is wonderful. Yep. Okay. I hate to be redundant. I might have one little caveat in here, but my nominees are Ludwig Gordonson for Oppenheimer, Joe Hisaishi for The Boy and the Heron, Daniel Pemberton for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Mika Levy for The Zone of Interest, and my last nominee here is Jerskin Fendrix for Poor Things. Uh, but yeah, it, this is Oppenheimer all the way. I don't know what else to add. The music is <laughs> immaculate. I just love how it complements the bombacity of that film. The, the, the largeness yeah. of it, the scale of that film, yeah, um, the energy that Nolan is trying to capture there, and not just in terms of uh, like the the mechanics of them trying to figure out how to make this nuclear weapon, but the back and forth within the narrative, the fusion and the fission of it all, the music just complements that idea so impeccably every minute of th that that score is just impenetrable it, it's it's so it's, a character. it's a character it's a character it's absolutely yeah. remarkable stuff so i mean i love all of these other four nominees i have here and the ones you guys mentioned as well and, and i mean this is a, a, was a great year for scores and it's just also one of those years where the best one stands above the rest easily <laughs> for me as well uh yeah great stuff there yeah okay best animated movie what do you guys got jay very good year for animation i will yeah. preface this by saying i think there are four really really good films and then i've got a little bit of a drop off with my five but mm -hmm. uh as far as my like pretty elite four i have the boy and the heron i have robot dreams i have spider-man across the spider-verse and teenage mutant ninja turtles mutant mayhem mm -hmm. for the sake of filling out a five i'll throw in nimona which i think is okay oh i haven't seen um, that yet um, yeah, it's, it's not bad. Uh, I just want it on the record just to stir the pot for no reason at all. Elemental stinks. Uh, and my winner is uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This was actually probably the hardest final decision for me between uh, Across the Spider-Verse and The Boy and the Heron. But when it kind of came down to it, as stupid as I feel not picking a Hayao Miyazaki movie for Best Animated Film... I just kind of had had to put myself in my shoes when I was watching Across the Spider-Verse for the first time and just how I thought to myself, I have never seen a movie structured as, as formally a, an animated film as formally experimental as this in a very, very long time. Um, and I just remember watching that and the varying styles of animation for the varying sequences that are representing the various mental spaces of the characters in that film. And again, I talked about propulsiveness with Oppenheimer across the Spider-Verse certainly has many of those same traits. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a really captivating uh, movie going experience for me. So as much as I do love the boy in the Heron and gosh, I love the boy in the Heron. Uh, I'm almost surprising myself. I'm going to give it to Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. It's probably your, it's your speed racer of the year, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I those hold a similar kind of place in my heart Yeah, for sure. Just how, ambitious and audacious they are yeah okay. i um i only have four nominees in this category <laughs> because i didn't think that there was a fifth one good enough to get that other spot so i threw it out and my so my four uh nominees are You're challenging the form much like spider-man yeah. across the spider-verse you know i'm making up my own rules jd says yeah. it's our awards we do what we want with them and you know hey 
Yeah, we're um, not stopping you. Maybe I'll give a six spot to somebody else. Just kidding. I uh, won't do that. No, no, that, uh, that you can't no, do. No, no, I can't. No, you can omit, <laughs> you can add. Um, math, subtraction, not addition. Uh, the Boy and the Heron, uh, Robot Dreams, uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Teenage uh, Arms. Yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. See, it was, I got my. it's a tongue twister. It is. Um, I I really liked all these movies. Um, and I'll, say, I'll save my thoughts on, on The Boy and the Heron, my winner. Um, because I will be talking there. Spoiler alert! I will be talking about this as one of my favorite films of the year on the next episode. A, a truly a transcendent piece of work from one of our greatest minds that have has ever ever created cinema in Hayao Miyazaki. So, Boy and the Heron. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's keep the repetition going here. My nominees are the Boy yeah, and the Heron. Going to be pretty consistent. Yeah, I, it's it's all going to be about that fifth spot, right? Um, the Boy and the Heron, Robot Dreams, Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. I have those four nominees. I did like Suzume, uh, the new film from Makoto Shinkai, at least for the most part. So I, I have it enough here to at least include it as my fifth nominee, even if it is the lesser of these five films for me. I am with you, Ryan. My winner is The Boy and the Heron, but not by much. You know, I, I it's between that and Spider Man Across the Spider Verse for me, which I'm sure it'll be for a lot of people. I don't think that's a really controversial thing to say. But I think both of these movies are among the best movies of the year. And I'm sure we'll be talking about them quite a bit for not just the rest of this episode, but even more so as we get to our top tens of the year in part two. Uh The Boy and the Heron especially I'll have some thoughts on. I think it's a wonderful film. So I'll leave it at that. I think it's great. And I think it's one I'm gonna like more as time goes on. Like there's so much to find. I with guess. It. Yeah. Such that, a that's dense it, movie. Oh it, my yeah, gosh. it really is. And that's something I really appreciate about it. And I have to say this. I have to say this about Spider-Verse. I was like kind of mixed on the first one, but I think this new one is absolutely fantastic. So it had to take a really special film in order to to overtake it because otherwise it would have been my winner. Like it's easy. Yeah, I feel like a freaking dum dum over here not picking a Miyazaki film for best animated, <laughs> but I, I had to be true to myself. What a at jerk. the same time. It's, um, well, I mean, I, I almost thought about that too because, and this is not a knock on Across the Spider Verse, but that film is more immediately great or at least you can recognize yeah. the greatness more yeah. immediately yeah. the boy and the heron i recognize like i i love that movie a lot but i'm kind of almost giving it like a like a like a forecast of sorts that i think i'm gonna like it even more as time goes on sort of like a, i've been yeah. thinking about it more yeah yeah. yeah yeah that's that's yeah. exactly what it is yeah that's one you can't watch immediately before doing an award show <laughs> like you no. need some time True. to wrestle no. with that one no uh as far as my nominees i'm with you guys the boy and the heron Spider-Verse, Mutant Mayhem, Robot Dreams, and then Elemental is the Ferrari of animated movies. That movie is doing things that people are overlooking or dismissing or just completely not getting all together. I, I, I don't think know, you maybe broke all Jake of the above. <laughs> that I, I, I've told Ryan, I have a one-hour Elemental rant in me if you want to do it, but I don't think don't, this is the, no. uh, the, the show. The it show is the Ferrari of animated uh, movies. It's, uh, it's quite good. This... It was an elite year for animation. The best year, hands down, from t- top to bottom since 2014. And it's not even close as far as I'm concerned. Uh, those top four, for sure. I, I will admit Ele- Elemental is my fifth nominee here, uh, but easily my fifth nominee. I think it's better than a lot of other stuff that came out this year, including Nimona, Suzume, others. You want to throw in there The Missing I believe Ryan mentioned earlier, which has gone missing in the whole awards conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, Elemental, easily, easily. It's one of Pixar's better works in recent years, and it's not even close as far as I'm concerned. So um, good stuff. But yeah, my and I don't think you have to be uh, too ashamed, Jay, because I will make this two for two. I, my winner here is Spider-Verse. Split ballot. We have a split <laughs> ballot. I love Miyazaki, love Boy and the Heron, and it is fascinating because... A month ago, we all were going to walk into this a slam dunk that Spider Verse was taking this category. Yeah, and then Miyazaki brings something in near the last minute that's just as good, if not arguably better. I mean, they're both right there as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I will give the edge ever so slightly to Spider Verse, and maybe it's because of the immediacy that you're talking about there, Brennan. I don't know. Yeah. But I love the the animation, the varying art styles, the way it taps into responsibility and deconstructing Spider-Man lore, uh, which maybe we'll get into in part two. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but it's all great. Really, really wonderful stuff. Okay. With that said, let's get to best international film. What do you guys have for this category? We'll start with you, Jay. 
This is an absolutely stacked category. I, I feel mm-hmm. foolish for some of the stuff that I don't have included uh, on yeah. my ballot here. Yep. But um, my nominees are A Fire, the uh, Christian Petzold film that I watched earlier today. So congratulations to uh, yeah. Yeah. A Fire. Uh, right. I have the, the aforementioned The Boy and the Heron. I have Fallen Leaves, which just what a discovery. Um, again, that was that was for me. And I have Godland, one of the most visually dazzling films of the year. Mm-hmm. And my final nominee and my winner is Godzilla Minus One. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. this is an absolutely spectacular film. Who knew that a Godzilla film could make you so damn emotional? This thing really <laughs> wraps you up and is just such a sweeping epic of a movie that is at once heartfelt, terrifying, thrilling, visually so full of visual splendor. I think it is one of the most kind of honestly made films of the year, which is so Mm -hmm. rare for like a big kind of blockbuster feeling movie like that. Um, So for me in a year with a ton of great foreign language films, Godzilla minus one, one of the great surprises of the year, and for me, just straight up, one of the great films of the year. Just maybe the best time I had at a movie theater this year was Godzilla Minus One. I don't know why you're surprised, Jay, that that movie is so moving. It was written by Hirokazu Kureda. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know who it was made coming. by? Was the I? <laughs> did you guys ever see that movie, Lupin the Third, the first, the animated film? I nominated it a couple years ago no, for best no. animated. Really good movie. <laughs> What's well, the and same director? Moved, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he moved from that to this and I never would have I didn't know that until after I saw it, but it's such a cuz I really do like that movie. It's a really good kind of um adventure movie and then this mm-hmm. is sort of along the same vein but just like stratospheres higher. Right? It's more of an achievement. It's um it, it rules. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. That's why it's one of my nominees as well. Godzilla minus one for best foreign language film. Um, I also have a fire from Christian Petzl, uh, anatomy of fall, uh, the taste of things, or as I like to call it, tasty things. Um, and it's French. It's not Southern. It, it, <laughs> tasty things. Tasty things. Um, and that's thangs with six A's. Um, wouldn't that be more like thongs? Hey. Tasty thongs. <laughs> Tasty thongs. Um, and then my last nominee is The Zone of Interest. That's my winner. I'll talk about it a lot more on the next episode, as it, I also think it's one of the best films of the year. I might talk about a couple of these films, actually, but I'm not going to say when or where on that show. I'm going to talk about it. It's called but Suspense. It. Yeah. Okay. It, but it's great. Suspense, which A Zone of Interest has in it. It yes, does. Those exactly. yeah. of interest. So yeah. nicely timed there, Ryan. Very nicely timed. Um, my nominees include The Boy and the Heron, Fallen Leaves, Godzilla Minus One, Perfect Days, and The Taste of Things. Uh, I, I almost wanted to include a sixth here because I, I guess past lives we're not really considering for this category. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't either. Um, if we're going to look at it more from an international stand, but I don't know. It's like... That one kind of split the difference for me. So I almost have it there as like an honorable nominee. But if, if we were to include it, it would have been in my five regardless. Um, but st- it's it, it was, I, I found myself questioning it a little bit too much. I think so. it's like 65 percent in English. <laughs> well, yeah. that's why we're calling this best international film to avoid the foreign language. part sure. of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to at least make that known in case any listeners are questioning why we haven't talked about it yet or if we're going to talk about it, whatever that reason might be. But it, Needless to say, it's still a great film. But of my nominees, I've got those other five I listed there. My winner is... I almost don't want to say because I really don't know. <laughs> um, it's I, I'll say this. It's between Perfect Days and The Boy and the Heron. Uh, and they're both among my two favorite films of the year. Where they're ranked as being among my favorite films of the year, That's they're kind of flip-flopping right now, if I'm being honest. So it's kind of a 1A, 1B kind of winner situation, if I'm being honest. Um, but I think they're both great. If I have to give the edge right now, I'll give it to Perfect Days. Uh, I just saw it, and that final scene is still lingering with me. And I'll leave it at that because I'll have more thoughts on that lead performance in just a bit. Okay, my nominees for Best International Film, although I will say I did cheat slightly on this category. I'm willing to admit 
I okay. Kind of All right. The rule slightly here, but as long as you don't do it, it again, came down to what Jay had noted earlier in the sense that foreign <clears throat> cinema this year was astounding. Yeah. And I wanted to take advantage of that as much as possible. So the boy in the Huron, an international film, I did not include for this category since I nominate, nominated it and animated. Okay. So I'm not including it He's here. He's a fan of the dub. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm, I am considering <laughs> past lives in this category. It is an international film, at least half international. Mm-hmm. Half of the production was international. So that's enough for me. I'm considering past lives here, as well as the zone of interest, anatomy of a fall, perfect days, and the taste of things. Those are my five na- nominees. And my winner for this, uh, we'll get to in part two. But as you guys are talking about several of these, if not all of them, in one way or another, will probably be talked about in part two. Uh, Phenomenal year for international film. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about best documentary. I'm really curious to see where this goes. It might not have been the strongest year for documentary, but I do think there were a few gems. Uh, I think I we just it. didn't see enough, or like, or, or maybe this is maybe. a distribution issue because like, like, so, so many, so many, a little of this, a little of that. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think there are yeah. so many potentially great ones that just didn't get the proper word of mouth or the proper distribution. Yeah, yeah th- for me, and I don't know if your guys' experience was this at all. I, I felt <laughs> like throughout the year, there wasn't much talk of anything documentary wise. Not in any real meaningful way. It wasn't. I blame Bob. I, I blame doing, Barbenheimer. May, may, may <laughs> I, I don't know. But like once I started doing some year end catch up and looking at what others were talking about as far as best docs, then I caught up with them and I'm like, oh, there were some good documentaries this year. But I, I feel like unless you did that research, it was hard to really know because these films mm-hmm. just weren't talked about all that much. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. So yeah. getting to that, I think it's a combination again of. You know, Netflix, you can normally count on them having like two or three really popular documentaries every year. I mm-hmm. think the pandemic probably made it harder to make documentaries for a couple of years. So I think we're still kind of in the aftermath of that. Maybe that's what but it is. Yeah. I'm going to pull a Ryan here to an even more extreme degree. I have two nominees for this category <laughs> between a combination of. Wow. Okay. Between a combination of uh, I prioritized catching up on narratives at the end of the year and just it being as far as just like things that people seem to have watched and really liked a down year for documentaries. I saw two documentaries I liked this year. One was the film still a Michael J. Fox story on Apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other was a high school football documentary called BS high on (laughs) Max, which was uh, very good. Um, I I think there are some we'll talk about Jay I am very confident you'll like to see. I'm sure that is, I'm sure that is the case. If it's a timing thing, I very much understand it though. Yeah. 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 And and I think that is what it is as much as anything, but I am going to go with still uh, the Michael J. Fox documentary as my winner here. Uh, Very touching heartfelt film that isn't really, I, I, I talked about how it seems like every popular documentary these days is a celebrity portrait, but this is a celebrity portrait. That's really not afraid of, looking at kind of the sharper edges of its uh, central figure. And I really appreciated that. And it just like, I don't know, Michael J. Fox's wife, just one of the saints on this planet. So oh, shout sure. out to her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a really touching documentary for, I would not call myself a Michael J. Fox super fan by any stretch, but his story is very captivating, very emotional. And uh, that's, that's a movie that really makes you feel. So uh, that's my winner still. Okay. Ryan. Yeah, um, I think that that was like the only documentary that anyone really uh, talked yeah, about. That was about the only and one. Kind of. Because yeah. yeah. that yeah. one and um, American Symphony, I think, are the ones that have been talked about the most. And that was late, pretty late in the year. And that was, that was yeah. late. And, uh, movie, and I feel like a lot of people talked about I American are... Symphony primarily because of the John Baptiste of it all. Just the timing mm-hmm. of him yes. as, a, as a figure, I think, really helped push that. Yeah, and I, uh, I personally... Uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of either one of them. Um, but, uh, you know, I just thought that they were, I didn't learn really much new about the subject matter and, 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 but I think still is it's a fine film and American Symphony, um, 
was a missed opportunity. Um, I only nominated three uh, because I was also trying to catch up on a lot of foreign language films, and I just and I just didn't get to them. There's some that I that I uh, want to catch up on, um, uh, especially off of the shortlist that was just announced mm-hmm. by the yeah. Oscars. Uh, but uh, Beyond Utopia, Four Daughters, and uh, The Pigeon Tunnel. Those were the three that I okay. did want to highlight. Okay. Um, and, and I'm going with, uh, beyond utopia. I think that that was like head and shoulders. Like that was the one where I was just like, wow, this is, this is actually pretty good. And, um, you know, it, 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 <laughs> it, it packs a punch. I think both in four daughters, uh, packs a punch by the end, uh, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, mm-hmm. but particularly this is just, you know, it, it, it feels just, I don't know how they got this footage for beyond utopia i mean like it it, it feels it's like astonishing yeah it's astonishing i mean like this isn't recreations this isn't like some sort of like this isn't a flea situation or, or whatnot like and and i like the balance in it yeah i don't know yeah. i don't know how what you guys think but like the balance of it of showing yep. that it's not just all about the successes of getting out it's also there are repercussions of failures yeah. that's the I, strength of it to me the that documentary is, yeah. lies on that yeah, yeah. and 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 then in the, I think then as the, for the audience, that makes your kind of heart start pound and that really gets you to buy in. And um, yeah, I think that it was, I think it was a really beautiful film and, and yeah. that's the one that I, I, I've given it to. I'm, I'm just going to kind of go backwards here and spoil this. Beyond Utopia is the only documentary I've seen this year that I think is great. It's the only one I actually truly, really liked. Now, there are other ones I did really like. I did like still a Michael J. Fox movie for the most part. That's also a nominee for me. And I also did really like Four Daughters and 20 Days in Mariupol. I think those are all very good films as well. So those are my four nominees. But I've seen other documentaries such as American Symphony, such as The Deepest Deepest Breath, such as Kokomo City that honestly I just didn't really care for. Uh, so I'm only going to include four nominees here, which include Beyond Utopia, 20 Days in Mariupol, Four Daughters, and Still. But Beyond Utopia I think is far and away the best one. I think it's a really great experience. It almost has like this procedural thriller kind of vibe to it it kind of reminded me a bit of like a paul greengrass film if that's any kind of like weird comparison i can make it to uh but it it, and that's not to say a movie like this needs to be thrilling in that way but the fact that it has such a guerrilla style that really just lends itself to that truth and the story that it's telling it's 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 really really powerful it really is a great documentary i think easily the best one that i've seen so far this year okay it appears I have done the most homework on this category. <laughs> well, I tried doing homework, and every time I got to something that people said was good, I didn't care for. Like Kokomo yeah. City, everyone says they really like. I did not like that at I all. I don't think – here's here's a, just a spoiler question. Does anybody have a documentary in their top 20? Beyond Utopia is close. close. I have one that's close. Yeah, yeah. so none. I, I mean, none. No, I don't. Yeah. Which is crazy. No, it's, it's not the greatest year on the whole. I will mm-hmm. say my top two – I struggled with similarly to Spider Verse and The Boy and the Heron. Mm-hmm. I think the top two docs for me rose to the top quite easily. I'm on the other side of it than Brennan. I think Kokomo City is quite great. For me, that's <sighs> one of the more interesting docs of the year because it's not, there's nothing conventional about how that shot, framed, told. And it's that's got the problem I have infectious. with it. It's so suffocating, it's almost afraid to tell those stories. Uh, see, I, I I would take that a thousand times over the convention of something like. I think that needed more still, convention. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No. Or the pigeon tunnel. Like I I I like the experimentation of Kokomo City quite a lot, and it's infectious. Okay. The energy of it is really compelling. So, uh, beyond Utopia, Four Daughters, Kokomo City are not nominees for me. Mm-hmm. Twenty Days in Maripol is a film I'm never going to watch again, but it's very. Neither would I. That but that do. is powerful. That is powerful. Oh you God. you gave that to me last minute. It's like I don't know if I want to watch. Yeah, this that was kind of the one now. where I was like, huh? Do I want to watch? It's the new pencil film watch. or it's the bleak. movie about the Ukraine. And like, <laughs> it yeah. is and, and almost bleak, name but... a movie and it was or the movie about Ukraine and I would take the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But look, it, it's a tough watch. It's a hard ask of anybody to watch yeah. that movie, but it like Grave of the Fireflies, its bleakness is the point. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah, it's yeah. very effective in that regard. Uh, so that's a nominee for me here. And then my last one, my fifth of these five is The Deepest Breath from Laura McGann. This category, though, for me came down to Beyond Utopia and Four Daughters. I agree mm-hmm. with you guys. Beyond Utopia is excellent. It's yeah. fantastic. And similarly with Spider-Verse, that was easily going to be my winner uh, up until a few days ago. 
and you know, like Boy and the Heron coming in kind of last minute and challenging Spider Verse. That's what Four Daughters did for me mm-hmm. with Beyond Utopia, and that is my winner. Four Daughters, I can blew understand me that. Away. Yeah, uh, this is the rewards of doing some of this homework last minute, I guess, because I don't know if I would have caught up with this without preparing for this war show, but I'm glad that I did because I was stunned by this movie. It's essentially a mother and her two remaining daughters recreating pivotal moments of their lives that allow them to therapeutically confront the traumas they've experienced, particularly as it relates to two other daughters of Ulfa's leaving the family to join ISIS. So you have the, these three individuals actively opening deep, deep wounds and allowing the artistic process to say something about who they are as a result of this tragedy. It is yeah. very Dick Johnson is dead. It is, it is very much in that vein. Yeah. And similarly, yeah. It's, a, it's an emotionally blistering watch yeah. as you see this family confront their traumas in a real way. In a real way. It's, and it's not always emotionally overwhelming. Sometimes they're having fun reminiscing. There's a lot of mm-hmm. laughing and jokes mm-hmm. to be made. But when they actually start the scene, when action is told, I could not help but think of something about the prowess of Dick Johnson as jet dad. I think this is doing something very similar, but in its own unique way that taps into its specific culture. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I just, it's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. There's some politics to it as well that I think are embedded in a remarkable way. Um, and the characters, I mean, without getting too much into it, but the people in front of the camera, sophisticated, complicated, <clears throat> relatable, yeah. human, all of the above. It's it's, 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 a, it's a remarkable movie. It's my number two of the documentaries that I listed from my nom- nominees. And you mentioned Dick, jo- Dick Johnson is dead as a comparison. I was actually thinking a lot about joshua oppenheimer's uh the act of killing yeah it's uh, just that like, as well the, that's another yeah the way that it like like it plays with form in a very psychological way uh by, by putting these subjects back into those places in a very bold and challenging and kind of devastating way uh, yeah. so I, I i found that really interesting as yeah. well and i think that's where the pretentious side of me just kind of gave weight to this film because like I love beyond utopia. Mm -hmm. Like you walk away from that film going as Ryan noted, how do they get that footage? Yeah. How, how, like it's, it's remarkable how it goes about its business. There's something about how four daughters uses art, like the artistic process that just captivated me a little bit more. Like to me, it just Mm -hmm. went slightly deeper into its premise for me. But again, like that's nitpicky kind of stuff because they're both great. They're both yeah. great, but that was the difference for me in the end. Um, yeah, very anyway, good film. Very. Good I, film. It ended up being a decent year overall for documentaries that I think its overall reputation seems to suggest. But again, unless you're doing the homework, you're not going to see or know about these movies. That's really the main point. Yeah, right? yeah, that's fair. All right, best cinematography. Jay, Ooh. What do you got? All right, one of my favorite categories here. Um, my first nominee is going to be Matthias Erdely. Uh, cinematographer for the Iron Claw. I think he is kind of one of the unsung shooting geniuses working right now. If he kind of really mm. pivoted and started working more and started working more in Hollywood, I think he would really make a name for himself. Uh, but his work with Durkin is spectacular. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric Messerschmidt with The Killer. Um, David Fincher is going to work you to the bone. And uh, he worked Messerschmitt to the bone, and he continues to be probably the best shooter of uh, digital cinematography working right now. I have Rodrigo Prieto for The Killers of the Flower Moon. Just a stunning film that has just the cheat code of incredible vistas, but also very purposeful camera movement and blocking and and, and lighting and all that good stuff. I also have uh, Maria Van Hoswolf for Godland, which again is Mm -hmm. very much working with a cheat code of on location in the middle of some of the most beautiful places you've ever seen on earth. Sure. Uh, But also the cinematography is kind of part of the themes of the film. It's it's crucial uh, to that film. Yeah. Very crucial to the storytelling and my final nominee and my winner. um, I I assume we're going to continue to talk about Oppenheimer as the, as the evening goes on. (laughs) But my winner is uh, Hoyt van Hoytma for Oppenheimer who just had all the resources in the world. Again, all the incredible shooting locations, 
And if you ask me right now, Hoyt Van Hoytma is the greatest cinematographer on the face of the earth. I think he is operating <laughs> Amazing, at yeah. a at a level above anybody else. I'm not saying he's the greatest of all time. I'm saying no. if Working you asked me to right make now. a movie right now, blind, and I was just fantasy drafting a cinematographer, I think Hoyt Van Hoytma uh, might be the guy I selected. You heard him. Jay said it first. Greatest of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Put words in his mouth. That's how it works. <laughs> the, the, the work that he does with this film speaks is it, so much in conversation with everything else. Like Christopher Nolan, CEO of this movie, aligned everyone's vision so precisely uh, that I, I I can hardly even comprehend it. And Hoyt Van Hoytma is one of the premier, most important cogs in that machine. So I am uh, I'm going with him for the win here. Oppenheimer, let's go. All right, Oppenheimer, another win for Nolan. Who would have thought? Oppen- it's Oppenheimer Oppen- and Oppen- Cocaine Bear. Those are the two <laughs> big winners today. More, more like Oppenheimer. Yeah. So I have uh, Hans from uh, of a fire. Uh, I have uh, Eric Messerschmidt for Ferrari, not uh, for okay. uh, fair, mm. not for uh, the killer. Um, though it was very, I was very close. I think his work in both films are, is astonishing. Um, Rodrigo Pareto for uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, Christian uh, uh, Blovelt or Blovelt uh, for May December, and mm-hmm. my fifth nominee and winner is this little guy uh, called Hoyta Van Hoytema for this little movie called Oppenheimer. No way! I, I, can't I mean, it's it. I can't believe it. I mean. <laughs> I mean, what this guy just like coming around here, and uh, you know, um, I I I don't do this a lot here at the In Session Film Awards, but um, yeah, uh, we 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 did a recount from last year, um, and um, I mistakenly uh, should not have given All Quiet on the Western Front the Cinematography Award because Nope existed, and uh, and I've thought about Nope <laughs> uh, pretty much like every week uh, ever since those awards. Uh, and I think Nope movie. would be my number two or three movie of last year in hindsight. Yeah. I, yeah, that and uh, spectacular. it is. Yeah. And I think that that movie was just the springboard to then the work here. And I think over these last two films, I think that he is the undisputed champion of cinematography right now. If I had to say who is my favorite, if I had to say um, maybe if it was with not a big director, maybe it was just with somebody small, though he's working with like Christopher Nolan and Jordan Peele. Um, who I mean, like that's not a bad company to yeah. work with. But at this point, it I would get in my seat for his work over pretty much anybody else shooting stuff nowadays. And I just think what he's able to do here with Nolan with the, the IMAX camera uh, and -hmm. create this beautiful movie that has so much tension. And it's not even just the, the great vest, uh, you know, like the, the shots of Los Alamos or the Mm -hmm. claustrophobia. yeah. Yeah. It's all the claustrophobia in the third act in those, in that, small shack of a office that's that creates yeah, this, this fluorescently this, lit office yeah and in congressional yeah. hearings and in backdoor you know um offices and stuff so uh, he's able to just uh, sometimes you know some people say oh it's the most it's the best you know what i mean and and it's mm-hmm. not usually the case in this i think it's a lot of cinematography and and, and he's using every trick of the trade to make an all-time epic film. Yeah, but it's also limited you know? cinematography as well. Yeah. Like, like the, the black and white sequences, mm-hmm. especially yeah. uh, fr- uh, uh, from Strauss's perspective, like they are, there's a simplicity to them that really does work in conjunction with the bigness yeah. of the movie. Yeah. And so it's I like mean, showy and it's, it's simplicity. showy, but it's tastefully showy. Yeah. Like, like, like then, it could be no cinematography, but it knows when to play, the, when to play mm-hmm. it to its limits. Uh, but it then also to the, the filming of the practical elements of the things that are inside Oppenheimer's head yeah. before, you know, during his Oxford day. I mean, like that's like a too. sci-fi movie. It, it does. Really, it feels, yeah. It yeah feels, those parts rock. Those it's incredible. Incredible Malick work movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is very ethereal in that regard. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very Malikian. We talked about that. Uh, Hoyt Van Hoekman doing some good things there. Uh, he's a nominee for me alongside Rodrigo Prieto for killers of the flower moon. I have a few different ones here. As far as my other nominees, I've got Ruben Impens for the eight mountains. I've got Robert D. Yemen for asteroid city. 
and Darius Wolski for Napoleon. Uh, movies just don't look like that as much anymore. Uh, so I wanted to at least acknowledge that. Whether you like the film or not, the film at least looks good and looks big. Um, yeah, Hoyt van Hoytma. I want to shake your hand, dude. I just want to shake your hand. That's all. I, I want to I, shake your hand. Um, you know, a movie is doing something right when you sit there in the theater and think, "How did like like I didn't know you could actually do that with a camera. I didn't know you can do that." And I had that reaction at least five hundred times watching Oppenheimer. Uh, so it's it's incredible work. I'll just leave it at that. I'm sure we'll talk about it more. I will okay. say I had that same sensation several times in Killers of the Flower Moon as well. Those were the two for me. I yeah, there, there are sequences in there for it sure. It sounds like we might have a sweep, but the oh, stuff well, that Prieto you... is doing I... as well is uh, hmm. impressive. Yeah. My winner for Best Cinematography is Salt Barn. I bet you didn't wow. see that. Wow. What, what a twist. <laughs> okay, love, so my... love that overhead tub shot. <laughs> <laughs> my nominees uh, for best digger. cinematography Rodrigo Prieto Killers of the Flower Moon Hoyte van Hoytema Oppenheimer Lucas Zal for The Zone of Interest Maria van Hoswolf one of my discoveries of the year is a nominee for best cinematography as well and Robert Yeoman for Asteroid City those are my five nominees We'll have to make it four for four, gentlemen. There it is. What there it is. We got you? it. We got it. Sweep I mean, it I don't know what else to add. You guys articulated it, it beautifully. We call that a I megaton. Mean, the whole film is shot exquisitely, but I yeah. might nominate him and give him this win simply <laughs> for that gymnasium speech sequence we talked about last week, which yeah. is the oh, scene of the yeah. year for both Brennan and I. And that final s- sequence, that final shot even, and what it mm-hmm. implicates is just remarkable stuff. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the camera it, it does so much heavy lifting in that film at times and does it immensely, beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love it. So, And then there's the whole black and white of it all, as you talked about, Brennan. So. Yeah. Good stuff. Oppenheimer. Man, what a movie. Turns out. Dang. What a movie. It does Last things. time that'll get talked about. It yeah, does I things. Bet. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to best screenplay best adapted screenplay specifically and should we simply rehash the internet discourse about adapted oh my goodness people have lost their minds over this i don't know what that means <laughs> oh uh, good category as far as i'm concerned i don't know if that's a hot take or not depends on who's listening uh yeah. jay yeah. what do you have for best adapted screenplay I'll stir the discourse pot immediately and say that Barbie is not nominated in either of my categories. And I will get to my <laughs> adapted screenplay nominees. Uh, my first nominee, this is a freaking loaded category. There are some yeah, that I really yeah. wish I could have squeezed in here. Yeah. Um, Sofia Coppola for Priscilla, I think is a wonderful adaptation. Um, Kelly Freeman Craig, who is on my list of don't even tell me what she's doing next. I'm going to see your next movie um, yep. for yep. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Uh, again, I, I want to talk about it more because I know it's not going to get talked about very much, but I'll I'll move on. Um, Eric <laughs> Roth and Martin Scorsese for Killers of the Flower Moon. A wonderful piece of adaptation. It just As far as like what is adaptation, that's sort of an incredible example of uh, just how to explore what adaptation can be. And finally, Takashi Yamakazi for Godzilla minus one kind of reinvented Godzilla in a way that I didn't really think was possible in 2023. But my winner is going to be Eric Roth and Martin Scorsese for killers mm-hmm. of the flower moon. Um, just really an incredibly humanist kind of exploration of these acts of violence. And then also the implication of, talking about those acts of violence and trying to portray them in an entertaining way. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just a really reflective work uh, that I think is going to age so well over time. We'll talk about kind of what this year represents to me and what particular movies mean and how I think history will look back on them. But um, I will just tease by saying, I think history is going to look very fondly upon uh, killers of the flower moon. So that's my pick for adapted screenplay Man, late Scorsese. Something about him. I love the legacy era of Scorsese. I really do. It started with Hugo. It started with Hugo. I'm with you, Brendan. Totally with you. All right, Ryan. I I have that at my number six. 
and it, oh, it killed me. Um, but this yeah, is a yeah. stack category. It I've got like stack. ten stack. films here that yeah, I almost I've could have got like been. ten or twelve. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and I you yeah. Jay knows this about me. I love it when you take a, a piece of work and you rework it to the bone to be something entirely different. And that's what I love about um the Killers of the Flower Moon script. So I just want to say that real quick. Um my five nominees are, are Andrew Hay for all the strangers. Okay. Um, Kelly Freeman Craig for Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. Um, Jay, I'm sorry to bring it up one more time. I promise I'll be quick. Christopher Nolan, Oppenheimer. Um, oh, and, I thought that was going to be the last time we talked about it. Yeah, I, I know. I can <laughs> believe it. Uh, I do agree. Sophia Coppola for Priscilla. What a wonderful adaptation of that of that, um, of that that novel. And then um, Ava DuVernay for Origin. Okay. Um, and um, my winner here is Andrew Hay for All the Strangers. Um, I think that again, that is, it's completely different from the book. Um, it's original source material and, and Hay sort of recontextualized it into this, just this moving piece about, you know, how one handles grief and how one moves on and how one tries to process all of it, uh, within this amount of time and, and how, uh, you know, new, new relationships are brought in and old relationships and, mm-hmm. and everything. I mean, it, 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 it kind of breaks <laughs> breaks your heart by the end and I think it's so such a beautifully written piece and he is a director that just puts his heart out there for all of us to sort of absorb when we're when we're uh, watching his movies and um, yeah Hayes film just kind of stunned me uh, the first time I saw it at Telluride and um, I think just over time and go back and watching scenes and um, and talking about the film with with everyone, um, it's just an, a beautiful, beautiful adaptation. And I hope that mm-hmm. uh, more as more and more people start seeing all the strangers, they can appreciate not just that great acting that we'll probably talk about here later, um, but that incredible script that is carrying all of them uh, and helping carrying them over to that beautiful finish line by the end of the film. So, yeah, uh, I love the I love the film and mm-hmm. I love the screenplay. Yeah, it almost became one of my fives and honestly the five that i have here could probably change in a couple of hours if i'm being honest yes yeah, i, this, I agree this, this, mm-hmm. this race here for best adapted screenplay the five nominees i have right now some of them have been talked about they include eric roth and martin scorsese for killers of the flower moon i also have kelly freeman craig for are you there god it's me margaret christopher nolan for oppenheimer and two others here that i'm surprised didn't get mentioned yet at least in passing but troy kennedy martin for ferrari and Andrew mm-hmm. Kevin Walker for The Killer are yep. the other two rounding out my five nominees. But again, number I, could, seven. I could have also talked about Andrew Haig for All the Strangers or Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach for Barbie, Sofia Coppola for Priscilla, Court Jefferson for American Fiction, all really great scripts. And they could all circulate within these five in some way, shape or form in a couple of days or so. Uh, but those are my five nominees as they are. My winner, I'm actually going to give it to Kelly Freeman Craig for Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, simply because mm-hmm. I think it is the most universal of all of these you sort of talked about this earlier in this episode jay how it's a movie that's not really made for any one of us specifically on this podcast yet we can find something to thematically Mm -hmm. relate to about it it's very open and inviting regardless of it being from the mindset of a young girl Uh, so we can't relate to the to that aspect of it directly but it's educational in a way that it does still feel inviting for those of us who might not go through that specific ex- experience, but Without it also like homework. Yeah. Well, yeah, it never feels like homework, but there's, there is a universality to it in the way that it depicts the effects of religion on families. And a lot of that yeah. is also credit to Judy Bloom and her source material. But the fact that that idea is portrayed here in a world in a time now that is so narrow minded with regard to political and religious beliefs I love that challenging notion. So I think the script writing there and the thematic intent is so universal, which is why I felt the urge to give Kelly Freeman Craig my award here. I think it's a really great script. All right. Good stuff. Good movie. As far as my five nominees, I will echo what you guys have already said. And Christopher Nolan, Oppenheimer, Eric Roth, Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon, Andrew Haig, All of a Strangers, Sofia Coppola, and her script for Priscilla, and my last one is Court Jefferson, American Fiction. I'm okay. very high on that film, especially the writing of it. I think it's really great. But my winner for this, I am wholeheartedly with you, Ryan. Andrew Haig, All of Us Strangers. 
is easily my winner here in a, Good in a dense yeah. category. I love the writing to all of us strangers. It's ideas of grief and loss and reconnection. I love how it channels this idea of, you know, the, this thought exercise, if you will, of reconnecting with those that we've lost and conjuring some sort of scenario where we could meet them, talk with them. And what would you say? How would that go? Like how that plays out here with Adam is so tender. It's raw. It's chock full of intimacy. And I love what it says about love and loneliness, but also how the experiences in our childhood shape us into adulthood, especially when we go through tragedy as we see Adam does in this film and how Hague funnels that idea through the conversation that Adam has with his parents and also with Harry, the Paul Mescal character. It's emotionally gripping, yes, but the details mm-hmm. in Hague's writing makes so many scenes in, in this film lived in and real. Even though we know there's some sort of artificiality to it all, it, it feels so relatable and um, deeply human. I, I love it. Some of the best writing I've seen in some time. Andrew Haig, All of Us Strangers, my winner. Good movie. A lot of great writing this year. We're gonna keep. Mm-hmm. We're gonna keep talking about it. We have another screenplay category to get to. Okay, so best original screenplay. <laughs> Jay, what do you got? My nominees for best original screenplay are Sammy Birch for May December. I have David Hemmingson for The Holdovers. Just a wonderful throwback of a script. I have Nicole Hall of Center for You Hurt My Feelings, which is basically like an empathetic version of like a Larry David script or something. It's like this Uh, very specific little thing that gets under somebody's skin, but ends up so cynical, but I love destroying a marriage. Um, I have Aki Karasmaki for fallen leaves, just a really small, specific, tender, sad, funny, everything of a script. And I have Paul Schrader for master gardener. What, what can I say? I love men writing in journals. Um, but (laughs) my, Love Winner is going to be Sammy Birch for May, December. I think that script is just so compelling. I love provocation when it has a purpose and May, December is a very provocative work. It's a very funny work. It has ignited some of the worst discourse uh, on film Twitter this year, which is generally the sign of a good script when you can actually, yeah, that's a great point. A movie. Great point. Um, but that that film to me is just so insightful and funny, daring, bold, um, and just has so many specific scenes that are so incredibly memorable. But even yeah. as a whole, it just has so much to say. So my winner is going to be May December, uh, a great, great film with a great, great screenplay. OK, great stuff. Sammy Birch. Sammy Birch. Great discovery um, this year. Absolutely. Maybe, yeah. Exactly. A nominee for me in the discovery category. And I will start with Christian Petzl for a fire. And I will then also nominate Wes Anderson for Asteroid City. Wes Anderson, I agree. JD had a wonderful year. Um, just, I mean, my God, uh, mm-hmm. he's just becoming mm-hmm. more and more confident. And that's weird to say he's like 12 films in yeah. Uh, yeah. at this point. Um, Sammy Birch for May, December. Ira Sachs for Passages. Mm, Why that. are we not talking enough about Passages? Um, it's mm. such a fantastic film. Mm-hmm. Uh, another film that I think goes really great with May, December in terms of talking about morality within the characters, uh, especially within a trio. And then Celine Song for um, for Past Lives. Yeah, And I agree with my friend, Jay Ledbetter. Sammy Birch Huzzah. delivered the screenplay of the year. And it was a screenplay that was on the blacklist. And um, first time screenplay too. Um, I think, wasn't she a casting director for smaller was, films yeah. before? She was a <laughs> casting director for some films, including the Hunger Games series. And um, <laughs> just an insane transition. And she got wow. to write this this film a that woman of that many is, talents is yeah. doing a juggling act of many things. I mean, it's talking about celebrity obsession, celebrity um, consumption of their. Um, their conception of essentially their subject matter. Um, how yeah, is that an original them. screenplay about adaptation? It's, yeah, it's exactly. interesting. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. And then it, of course it is also about uh, this, this 
inspired by story that is now going to get as many and i mean in Jay mentioned that it was controversial. It's like it's not surprising it's controversial because oh god, people, no. because people on the internet are too dumb enough not to <laughs> actually like be able to handle something as nuanced as, as a movie like this. And I think that this this yeah. movie is this movie, much like most films with Todd Haynes, is a delicate wire act, and it is doing it in such a profound way. And yes, there are moments uh, where this movie is absolutely hilarious. Yes, there are moments where this mm-hmm. movie is absolutely terrifying, and then there's moments that are absolutely heartbreaking. That's called freaking life, folks. All right, and called it's called movies. Also, it's called movies, and it's called the intent of what it's Nuance. trying to say by the end. And it's and it's yeah, it's a lot of. What reminded me what I loved so much about another movie made by a guy named Todd and Todd uh, Field last year with Tar. It's a prickly little bastard. And I love that about it. And um, I got to talk to Sammy Birch about it. And she's like the nicest human being on the planet. I've seen those interviews. So, she seems so sweet. Like so, I would never so think, weird someone, that it, never yes, think exactly. someone like her would write such a like, like there's a lot of cynicism in this movie. Exactly. Too, that, that originates from the script. It's really incredible. And that cynicism provides honesty, I think, from somebody yeah. that's been inside the the machine. So, True. Um, yeah, it's it's a wild screenplay. Absolutely. It is. Love it. it love is. it. Love it. Yeah. She's a nominee for me for May, December. I also have actually looking at my nominees here, my five, it's almost the exact same as Jay's. <laughs> so we're kind of in sync on this one. But I have Sammy Birch for May, December, David Hemmingson for The Holdovers, Nicole Hoff Center for You Hurt My Feelings. Uh, but I also have Celine Song for Past Lives and Justine Tria and Arthur Harari for Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, round out my five nominees here. I guess I'll keep the train going. I get I'm giving it to Sammy Birch for May December as well. So we're we're oh, three for four man. unless JD, on, JD breaks it. Yeah, so pressure's on JD. I I, I think I know where he's going to go. I won't say what I think it is. Um, but I do love what Sammy Birch is doing for all the reasons that we just talked about. Plus, this script has something that no other movie had this year. Hot dogs. Yeah, that's, this is a that's lot a of good hot dogs. a lot of them. A how does everybody grill. like? Their, how does everybody like their hot dogs? But dog? is it enough? I don't know if it's enough. Uh, I keep mine pretty simple. Are I like mine plain. plain. I like I mine like plain. A regular dog. Just give me some yeah. catsup, some mayo. Maybe, some maybe, maybe a little chili. Everything maybe a little chili. Bun. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Now Jay's so, getting real specific. I just like. Uh, mm-hmm. I like uh, sweet relish and mustard. That's all I need. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fair. Yeah, yeah. But I do like hot dogs. Nothing too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can eat a Chicago dog if it's in front oh, of me, but. Now I'm getting hungry. All right, JD, go to you. All right, JD, keep going. You can't talk about hot dogs. All right. <laughs> I have some in the fridge. I might make some after this podcast. All right. Best original screenplay for me. My nom- my nominees here are Justine Trey and Arthur Hari for Anatomy of a Fall, Celine Song for Past Lives, David Hemmingson for The Holdovers, Sammy Birch for May December, turns out. My last nominee here is The Great. Wes Anderson, Asteroid City. This was maybe the hardest category for me, guys. Yeah. I could There's have still picked time any to one change of these five. To unite the four. <laughs> yeah. This is probably going to be the category. Brendan, I believe you noted this some mm-hmm. moments ago about how quickly this could change. Yeah. I could delve in between these five you know, from moment to moment, depending on what I've seen last or what's been on my mind the latest. Uh, I love this category. I love all five of these. I'm sorry to say I am going to break the trend here slightly. As much as I love Sammy Birch, May, Mm -hmm. December, awesome script. I also thought heavily about the holdovers, awesome script. But I can't shake Celine Song. That's the one I thought you were going to go with. Yeah. Celine Song for me is like her I love her direction but mostly it's her writing like the the yeah. way she yeah. writes this film is where it's at its strongest the performers of course tap into it impeccably but the writing here is really great and I think what I really love about it is its pragmatism this is a film that sets up something where it could have been very movie movie-ish right where they split apart as kids One's in Canada, one's in Korea. They find each other on the internet. And guess what happens? They reconnect, guys. And they, <laughs> they, they find each other and they live happily ever after. That's a fun story. Sure, that could be great. Mm-hmm. But that's not what Celine Song is concerned with. 
Right. And that's why the discourse of all the films for the internet to get crazy about in recent days, it's got to be past lives. And to Ryan's mm-hmm. point, the dummies, I do not understand where they're coming from. It is <laughs> incredibly sophisticated. And I love the pragmatism and the commitment to it. Celine Song wants us to toy with the fantasy, but ultimately we have to live in reality. And that's what's so brilliant about the addition of the husband character and writing him in a way where he is lovable. He's endearing. He's as empathetic. There's nothing antagonistic. Again, a movie version yeah. of this would have him doing the thing where he's out to get. Oh, this you feel bad guy. for him. You feel bad for him. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Like, and, and I love that, but and and the film does it without ever forsaking Nora in the middle of it. We don't ever right. it doesn't ask you, you to know, pick a side between their yes, dynamic. We don't judge like her because she's indulging this friend of hers from South Korea that she, that was ripped away from her again going back to choices in this film. Like, you know, everyone understands why she makes that choice. But that's what makes her husband her the scenes with her husband so great and the writing in it all is just so tender and beautiful and lovely. Oh yeah. There are exchanges here that I won't forget. Uh, oh, yeah, and it's yeah. and it's interesting. Like it, it, there are exchanges I never would have thought to think about, and I probably should have. Uh, like like the idea that maybe in any interracial marriage, if one dreams in their native language, how does the yeah, other one feel scene, when they hear them the talk out yeah. loud? It's like like that is such an interesting thought. Like why did I never think about that? Because yeah, that's like someone dreaming in a language that their counterpart, their mm-hmm. their spouse, doesn't understand. It's a yeah. world they don't know how to live in. So Absolutely. it's so you know, interesting. One of the more heartbreaking moments of the year and what makes Arthur such a fascinating character in that film. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're all great. I mean, the bar yeah. scene, you, the writing of that is just impeccable. One of the best yeah. scenes of the year as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the writing of this film, that is Celine Song's strength for sure. I, again, love her direction, but it's her writing that makes past sure. lives what it is. And for me, it's one of the best <clears throat> films of the year. And, as much as I love May December and all of its prickliness, as you guys talked about, prickly, I can't I love escape that word for it. <laughs> the, the the layers of past lives. I love it. It's how it's many layers? Eight thousand. Eight thousand layers 8, of onion. Layers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well said. All right. Speaking of direction, though, let's get to it. Best director, Jay. Yeah. No, this a big is one. a category. And I mean, before before we just get into it. We just need to acknowledge how many all-time cinematic auteurs made movies in 2023. It is kind mm-hmm. of astounding. Like, yeah. My, we, my list uh, here. Should we, before you get into it, Jay, what are the chances that we all have the same pick here? Pretty high, right? We think? That we all have the same winner? Winner. Yeah, not nominee necessarily. I think but that it's pr- I, th- I, th- I think it's pretty, decent. I think, yeah. I th- pretty I think high? We can pretty, I pretty much bet money on it. The same winner. Yeah. You need to adjust your damn ballot. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what right. I said. Also, yeah. and JD, going back to what you were just saying, real quick, uh, those people on the internet, uh, I coined the phrase now. They're just ding dongs. I'm bringing that back. <laughs> ding dongs. Jabronis. Jabronis. Ding dongs. Yeah. Jabronis, ding-dongs. Ding-dongs. Yeah. yeah. Just okay. call them ding dongs. Jabronis. Right, ding enough. dong. All right. I think so, there's, yeah. I, I, I would say, I would say there's a, Better chance than not that we all have the same winner for director, but we'll yeah. but we'll see. But Elizabeth, it's kind of, thanks for Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> got four nominees. But, but let me just like <laughs> just nominations. throw this hypothetical out there. If prior to 2023 you were to say there's a Michael Mann movie this year, Jay's going to love it, and he's not going to have Michael Mann on his best director ballot. Odds of that would be pretty low, but yeah. Yeah. he's not on my ballot. He's probably my six. Um. But my nominees are crazy. my first nominee here is going to be like number one on the Jay's guy list right now. Sean Durkin is like my guy. Of course. He, he yeah. is the Durkin he hive, is, as you um, call it. Guess. Yeah. And the the nest a couple years ago was my number two of the year. And now with with the Iron Claw, he's only further solidified him as kind of like my must see directors working right now. That movie You're welcome, to Jay. me is like so <laughs> devastating. You're, you're welcome. Um, next, there's a little guy by the name of David Fincher who made yeah, what many go. people are claiming to be a minor film in his filmography, The Killer, which I wholeheartedly disagree with. I think it is in many ways a turnkey to his inner self, like his most inner self uh, oh, yeah. fascinating film. Uh, yeah. Todd Haynes for May, December, who has made, again, just like this very provocative, thoughtful, funny, uh, honest film. 
Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer and uh, Martin Scorsese. Maybe you've heard of him for uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. What mm. a freaking list right there. Uh, but my winner is going to be Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, and I will just oh, not say anything more and believe. move on to Ryan. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many. I mean, this is why I'm looking at the 2024 list of films, and I know you guys will be doing that in a couple weeks. And I just, I'm like, I don't think that year is going to be good at all because this year is such an embarrassment of riches from so many directors that i love so and yeah so 2023 is going to be both the best and worst movie year of all time because nothing yeah. can live up to it now i mean exactly. truly truly Spoiled if us. you go down the list nolan scorsese durkin haynes fincher Payne, man uh miyazaki coppola schrader wes anderson kurzmaki like uh song uh, staleski uh <laughs> kelly reichert <laughs> Steven soderberg Berwig. You know what I mean? It's yeah. astounding. Pain. Yeah, you mentioned pain. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. It's laser. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Um, so Hayao Miyazaki for The Boy and the Heron. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I don't really need to say much about these guys. You're just going to get it. Um, Todd Haynes, May, December. Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Um, Jonathan Glazer, The Zone of Interest. And, um, and Martin Scorsese for The Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, it was I was so close to to giving it to really all of them, but I saw a movie in July that kind of blew me away, and that's all I need to say. I'll have more thoughts next episode <laughs> on that film, and it's a movie called uh, Oppenheimer, and it's Christopher Nolan, and there's no other director this year that even came close. Thank you very much. I'll kick it over now to Brendan. Todd Haynes for May December, Aki Kurosaki for Fallen Leaves. Great pick. Hayao Miyazaki for The Boy and the Heron, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, and my last nominee is Wim Wenders for Perfect Days. Um, I almost wanted to give it to Hayao Miyazaki because of how, not even personal that that film is to him, but like like the fact that the movie is kind of about him indirectly, like it is very much a director's yeah. movie. In some ways you could say it is the director's movie of the year. But Oppenheimer is the technical achievement of the year. We, we talked about it so many times because of its individual components that are so good. We, um, we, we honestly should have had a category for best editing just to honor the editing of the film, which is yet another character in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, just Christopher Nolan's facilitation of everything coming together for this movie. It's a grand vision. It really is. And I do think He's it is technical the achievement Oppenheimer of the year. of directors. He is, yeah. yeah. Totally <laughs> blew it Danny up. Danny Ocean of directors. He totally blew it up, yeah. <laughs> All right, my nominees for Best Director, Todd Haynes, Martin Scorsese, Christopher Nolan, Jonathan Glazer, and my boy, Wes Anderson. Those are my five nominees. Mm-hmm. And my winner for Best Director, Christopher Nolan. Yep, yeah, you guessed hey, it. It's Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. Man, what are such contrarians? I know. <laughs> Dude's <laughs> it's the his grain. Year. He should win the Oscar if he doesn't. Yeah. He won the Golden writing. Globe tonight. He just won the Golden Globe. Yep, yeah, there you go. He won the Globe as we're recording on his way to an Oscar as it should. That's that's what should happen. Doesn't always, but yeah, Christopher Nolan with the achievement of 2023. There's no doubt about it. We'll Globes talk are on more a roll. about it. In part two. All right. Best actress in a supporting role. All right, Jay, what do you got? This was another stacked category. I really mm-hmm. liked uh, looking through this one. Uh, my nominees are Hong Chow from Showing Up. I think she's just so <laughs> That's an inspired that pick. That's a that really so interesting much. pick. <laughs> That's um, so good. <laughs> I have Penelope Cruz in Ferrari. Just a freaking pipe bomb of a performance in that movie. Uh, I have Manami Hamabe, pardon on the pronunciation, from Godzilla Minus One, who is kind of the heart and soul of that movie, which mm-hmm. is a real, has a real beating heart to it. Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers, who is probably going to win an Oscar, and she uh, totally deserved. She's yeah. electric in that movie. And I have Rachel McAdams for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Just such a... I don't even know what to say about that performance. It's just so you, she makes you feel so immensely uh, in that film in so many different ways. But my winner is going to be Penelope Cruz for Ferrari, who again is just a freaking, because it's not 
a very loud performance most of the time. It is this very contained yeah. performance, yeah. but Despite there the is so much tension around. to yeah. everything that she is doing in that film. And she is really driving the drama of that movie. And while so many of her actions can feel selfish, the reality of kind of where those actions are coming from are also are actually like entirely understandable and um you can totally sympathize with her character over the course of that film, but just on a scene by scene basis, watching her perform the the way that she will go from one emotion to another so dramatically, so effectively, so smoothly yeah. is captivating. <laughs> and she is really kind of she steals that movie from uh, Adam Driver, in my opinion. And it doesn't take much to steal it from Shailene Woodley, but she steals it from her as well. <laughs> um, she she that that movie is owned by Penelope Cruz. So I'm she's telling my winner. you, I know Brendan yelled at me for using this earlier, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> oh, Shailene great. Woodley is objectively hilarious in Ferrari. She it is <laughs> unrelentingly funny. Everything she does, just busting out laughing i mean i don't I, yeah there. it's it's i i don't know I, I don't find it like horribly detrimental to the movie as a whole oh, no but. i say that as a positive i i love uh. that a part of it. <laughs> no don't get me wrong that, that's a that's a that's a knock on the film that i i appreciate i love that she just gives up or doesn't even try or however you want to describe it you're right that it had to have been shot in order or something like that because yeah, she does give up weird. midway through yeah well the best supporting actress. Uh, my nominees are uh, Paula Beer for A Fire, okay. and Julia Binoche for The Taste of Things, uh, Sandra Huller for The Zone of Interest. Uh, spoiler alert: um, That's the only time Sandra Huller is going to be on my list because I think that that's the best performance she gave this year. Um, okay. Rachel McAdams for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, and Julianne Moore for May December. And I was very close to give Julianne Moore for may december but ultimately uh jay mentioned her uh, rachel mcadams blew me away and are you there god She's is my number Margaret. two i think I yeah missed her so much in movies and i think this performance is just absolutely beautiful yeah. and is within the moments of almost silence there is a scene then I don't know if you guys talked about it. This as a scene of the year, but there's a moment where she's unpacking the boxes. She's at loan at the house yeah, and a bird a flies yeah. to the window and she gets inspiration again after her yeah. inspiration's yeah. been gone. And it just says everything you need to know about that character, the beauty of what uh, this movie is going after and really what this mom, this woman is, is feeling in this moment. And I just think it's just special work from McAdams, who's an actress that I really think, you know, she she stepped away and she, she you know, is, isn't didn't do as much anymore in the Hollywood machine. She became a mom and stuff like that. And it really mm -hmm. shows and a truly, truly special work here. So, yeah, I just uh, there was no other person. And I know that she's kind of become like the Internet's favorite pick. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I had to had to go Rachel McAdams. Oh, she's so good in that movie. She's a nominee for me as well for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. I also have Dave I and Joy Randolph for The Holdovers, Sandra Huller for The Zone of Interest, Penelope Cruz for Ferrari. As far as my last nominee here, you know what? You mentioned there, Ryan, Juliette Binoche for The Taste of Things. And I kept going back and forth. Is that supporting or is that lead? That is, and, I think it's supporting. You think I it's supporting? Okay, yeah, yeah. and that because I I was going back and forth. I have it in supporting, but I was still doubting myself a little bit there. Um, but I do have her then, given that conversation we just had, uh, as a supporting performance here. So she's my fifth nominee for best supporting actress. She's also my winner. Uh, she's the reason why I really fell in love with that film, The Taste of Things. Tasty uh, things. Tasty things or tasty thongs as many Asian yeah, Binoche <laughs> star tasty things. <laughs> Julia Binoche. But it, it made me realize that every time I see Julia Binoche in any movie, and this is the same reaction I've had over the course of the past like five or six years, she might be my favorite actress. Uh, she blows me away every single time. And, and even like she knows how to balance like tender and loving with like dark cynicism in some of these other films like clouds of Sils maria for instance like, like she, she just has a range and 
the way she taps into this tender quality and the fact that she's kind of doing it in a meta way with the taste of things. The fact that her co-star is someone that she was married to in real life at one point. Like that, like that yeah, idea wild. and the fact that they have to confront that. Like, the it, French it, are so weird. They, they are very interesting, <laughs> bold individuals. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, they have a good appetite. They know how to cook good food. Oh, yeah, um, but yeah, just do. that simple idea between her and her co-star in that film, it, it, it turns this movie into something else entirely about regret and forgiveness that probably wouldn't have been there otherwise. Uh, so I think her inclusion there and the fact that she's really willing to embrace that challenge and that emotion head on, I think is really quite stimulating. Uh, Julia Binoche, I think, is wonderful in this movie. Yeah, great stuff. Do love Juliette Binoche in that film. She is a nominee for me as well. You guys talked about Rachel McAdams. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. A nominee for me. Penelope Cruz. Ferrari. Mm -hmm. A nominee. Divine Joy Randolph from The Holdovers is my fourth nominee. And my fifth, I know this is a, a pretty great role on the page. But Danielle Brooks in The Color Purple, I think, is electric. She is, is good. Really yeah. great in that film. And is my fifth nominee here. My winner for this, I am completely with you, Jay. Penelope Cruz in Ferrari is my winner for Best Supporting Actress. Yeah, she was probably Let's my number go. two. Almost one. So good. She is a force of nature in this film. And there are moments that stand out in, in that regard. You, know, you see the clips going around on, on social media. But I do agree, Jay. You make a great point that most of that performance is her channeling that forcefulness in this much more quiet, introspective way that mm -hmm. unleashes itself in those more bombastic moments. But what I think about most in this film is the grave scene. I would have nominated her alone for that grave moment at the beginning of this film. Oh, sure. And I love the close-up, Michael Mann. God love yeah. him. That is an, an immaculately shot moment, and I just love the stillness of it, love the performance there, or the moment of her walking down the hall <laughs> with the yeah. gun in her hand, or I think about her reaction to that piece of information at the bank, even when she approaches the house, the way she confronts uh, Enzo there, uh, like she's she does it in this really incredible, certainly electrifying, robust way, but it, it's coming from this more quiet, introspective mm -hmm. manner uh, that I love. But even in the outburst that she has and that big fight between her and Enzo, I love how impassioned it is. I love the almost myopic nature of it. And you you feel for her because she did give Enzo a son. Mm -hmm. Everything was taken from her. Enzo might have found a way around, you know, keeping his legacy alive. But what is she going to do? Like that's it's She's something that she ghost. has to wrestle with. And and the way she uh, kind of goes about, you know, trying to break through those those barriers, I think, is just absolutely incredible to watch. It is an engrossing performance from beginning to end. It's and, a very funny uh, performance, too. And funny at yeah. times, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I I just love it. I and and talk and that was one of the best surprise performances of the year as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't even real. I didn't going into it. I knew she was in it. I wasn't sure what kind of role she was going to play, let alone for it to have the prowess that that she gave to it. I mean, just a stunner of a of a performance. Yeah, yeah. All right, Penelope Cruz. She's in the Never Bad Club. Yeah, of course. She's just always great. Yeah. All right, best actor in a supporting role. Jay, what do you got? All right. I'll go ahead and knock out my top three nominees here, which are sort of chalk. I've got Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, Ryan Gosling for Barbie, and Charles Melton for May, December, who I'm sure will get a lot of play over the course of this award season. Um, and my final two are Holt McElhaney in uh, The Iron Claw. That's a good one. just gives like a great, powerful performance yeah. as this kind of domineering father figure. And then kind of on the opposite end, as far as, playing a cartoon character, I have Chris Messina in Air, who is ah, just huh. entertaining okay. for every single second he is on screen, <laughs> playing yeah. just the most obnoxious um, sports agent you've ever seen in your life. So um, that's my five. But yeah, my winner yeah. is going to be Ryan Gosling in Barbie. I just, he okay. is so 
unbelievably funny in that movie. And I yeah. rewatched that <laughs> movie on New Year's morning with a, a dull headache um, <laughs> and just had a ball with it. And again, just it's all the small stuff he does, like shaking his tassels when he gets his little cowboy outfit on and just his delivery of all these lines about sublime horses and mojo just, dojo casa house <laughs> mojo dojo casa house that movie is the best thing that movie has going for it is how hard its actors commit to the bit and just yeah. how committed they are Fully to the committed. work yeah. that they have yeah. and gosling and robbie both accentuate that to the fullest yeah but it's almost gosling has an easier job and thus easier to like score a 100 on the test because he's not asked to deliver all of the emotion that Rob- Robbie has to mm-hmm. at all points. So if you just look at like, Hey, here's 15 slam dunks, do your best. Gosling just slams them home with the force of a thousand gods uh, mm-hmm. at every, at every instant. So yeah, for me, it's just like, Based on what he was asked to do, he scored a 110% on the test. Um, and so he is he is my winner. I love the way he promoted the movie and promoted the character of Ken leading up to the movie. Just saying things like, this Ken guy, like he's he's going through some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I, 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 he, he's almost got that same kind of quirky sense of humor in real life that I just can't help but give Ryan. Gosling yeah. He's so, for. he's so good on a press tour. He's so good that he almost convinces you occasionally that Simu Liu is like a viable, uh, <laughs> star, a you know, viable if, if, uh, Hollywood if we're, presence. If we're ranking our favorite actors and actresses that we just love to simply grab a drink with Ryan Gosling is topping that list for me. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. He's, he seems great. He's so good at comedy. It's not fair yeah. that somebody can be that good of an actor, that funny, and that good looking. It's it's cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Guy. Okay. We get it. Uh, Ryan Gosling's great. I'm the. <laughs> we have a Ryan here, and I'm. You know, it's. it's this Ryan's little, pretty cool too. Yeah. yeah this we're one's, not comparing Ryan. I mean, I'm, I'm 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 better, but you know, it's fine. Um, but uh, no, you know, Gosling's great, and it's um. I mean, I I don't think he's as revolutionary as some people think he is because this is like the first time people have ever seen comedic performance from him. Watch the nice guys for Christ's sake. Or I I agree with you there. I'm not giving it the no, no. I'm not saying you, Jay. But no, no, Jay. I'm not saying you. I think some people have taken this this performance to his freaking rules. Rules, and he is extraordinary in that movie. And I think that like this is like they're like he's never done comedy before, and I'm like. No, he has, and he's done it really well throughout his career. But he's very, very good in Barbie. That's not a, a you know a slap at Jay giving that award. It's just the ding dongs. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> best my best supporting actor nominees are John Magaro for Past Lives, Charles Melton for May December. This like no name actor who did a performance in Killers of the Flower Moon, Robert De Niro. Um, <laughs> you know that guy, whatever. Um, never has done anything. Um, hopefully it works out for him. Uh, Ben Wishaw in Passages, mm. I think it's for Alamo. And I'm going all the way with it. I'm gonna do it. Donnie Yen for John Wick Chapter Four. He was my six, Ryan. Let's just let's Ooh. just do it. Let's just say it. That He's was so a good in phenomenal that performance. That is yeah. a good one. And, and yeah, elevated really that Chapter Four to a whole nother level. And it's because of him going toe to toe with with Keanu and everything. Absolutely having a ball. I yeah, usually always throw a curveball in there for you guys, you know, just a performance that I absolutely love. And um, and and that is maybe off the beaten path, and that was definitely it. But my winner here is Charles Melton for May December. And it has been ever since I've seen it. Mm-hmm. I'm going on uh, I've gone on the record. I'm it's my quote is all over town. Uh, you know, yeah. um, and I'm currently you can't backtrack. recording this. Even I if can't you backtrack to. saying it. <laughs> I think Charles Melton delivered not just the best supporting actor performance i think he delivered the best performance of the year by any yeah. other actor I, I i i remember you saying that yeah and i think that it, he is absolutely phenomenal in it um i have a lot to say about may december but if you if you want an exercise if you want to take the the comedy out of it and everything just watch that film through joe's eyes and only take notes and study it through what charles melton is doing it is absolutely horrifying, 
heartbreaking and brilliant, brilliant mm. work by Charles Bum. And it's all in that physical performance. It's all sheltered in and everything. And as he's sort of blossoming out of it because of Elizabeth's arrival and with his wife and everything as well, and by Gracie's sort of unbalance in there, he's blossoming. And we then again see this, this vulnerable man child have to confront his past. Mm-hmm. And what Melton does there is absolutely astonishing. I, I have, I, I've not quite seen a performance like this in a long, long time. And yeah, it, it breaks my heart every time I watch it. And I, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nobody else. Nobody else could have got this award. Um, he's a nominee for me for those exact reasons as well. I also have Jamie Bell for All of Us Strangers, uh, Milo Mikado Granier for Anatomy of a Fall. Uh, I'll echo Jay with one of his nominees, Holt McCallany for The Iron Claw, and Dominic Sessa for The Holdovers is my fifth nominee here. I'll just simply echo Ryan. I will agree. I do think Charles Milton is the best performance in the supporting actor category as well. Uh, And you make a great point, Ryan, that there's something very physical about his performance that's not physical in the traditional sense, but like without him ever even speaking, you can get a sense of insecurity in him. It's like it's the way he hunches his shoulders, has certain gestures, moves a certain way. The fact that his posture is even kind of off, like there are little ticks about his performance that really showcase that man childness, if you want to call it that, that insecurity and everything. Uh, and I think for those reasons, just given how complex the character is on the page, I think Milton arguably had the most difficult task of anyone here. Uh, and he's really up to the challenge for sure, really needing to navigate and kind of formulate one of the most complex characters of the year as well. Uh, because there's so much that had to be, defined in performance in order to really articulate those things. Uh, and he's certainly up to the challenge for sure. I think it really is great work. So, yep, I'll agree with Ryan on this one. I think it is and my going favorite up against team. Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. Good grief. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Goes toe to toe with two of the best. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely delivers. I love Melton as well. He's a nominee for me. I also have Ryan Gosling for Barbie. I'm completely with you, Jay. Love his performance there. I have Ben Wishaw for Passages. Milo Mikado Grenier for Anatomy of a Fall. And my last nominee is Jamie Bell for All of Us Strangers. And look, I love Charles Melton. He is great. But there is no performance that knocked me down than what Jamie Bell does in All of Us Strangers. Uh, incredibly May moving performance. May have been my number two in this category. I absolutely love what he does here. I talked earlier about Andrew Higgs writing. And the writing is stellar for all the reasons I noted earlier, you think of a line as we've seen countless times on social media, I'm sorry I never came into your room when you were crying. Yeah. In context of that conversation, it is emotionally blistering, but the line haunts me not because of just what's there on the page. It mm-hmm. is powerful because of how Jamie Bell delivers it in his performance the way he articulates it it's the quivering in his voice the genuine sense of sadness he exhibits is profoundly moving in a moment like that or even right before we get to that line what i also love about the performance because there's the line from adam where he says you know i had good memories yeah of you as well And when he says that, there's a shot to Jamie Bell, and he struggles to receive that kindness from Adam. He Mm -hmm. looks away. Like, he has to put his head in his hands. Like, it's those little gestures throughout this film that I love as well. Or when Adam notes, you know, I I always thought of you uh, with the Christmas tree. You always love putting up the Christmas tree, and you get this this interesting little smile from Jamie Bell in the moment as well. Like Mm -hmm. what he does in terms of tapping into the power of that moment. Again, what's there on the page is excellent, but that performance takes the words and transcends it to a completely new stratosphere. It is an unbelievable moment. I love Andrew Scott as well. He's great in this film. But Mm -hmm. Jamie Bell and how he responds to Adam in those moments absolutely took my breath away. 
You know, I think of the moment later on around the Christmas scene and what he's doing there. And there, and there's of course the cafe moment that you get at the end as well. And you, you just see that emotion well up in this incredibly authentic and genuine way for a character in that situation, knowing what he was going to have to ask Adam, let yeah. alone the closure of it, but that question he has to ask. And, and again, the way he delivers it is just mesmerizing to me. Absolutely knocked me down. Love that performance. Um, I don't know if it's the best performance of the year, but it is unquestionably my favorite performance of 2023. Is Jamie your voice Bell, breaking a little bit there? Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I could. I could tell you love this performance. I, I think it is genuinely great. I understand why you feel that way, and I don't disagree at all. Uh, in fact, like I know Andrew Scott is getting a lot of the love from a awards standpoint when it comes to this film. And I do think it's sad that Jamie Bell is getting sort of forgotten. He is—he yeah. he does give my favorite performance in the film. All four of them should get attention. They're all great. All, well, yeah, four all four of those performances and all yeah. those strangers are immaculate. Yeah, yes. they're all very yeah. good. Absolutely. Jamie Bell, one of my faves. Definitely my favorite of the year. All right, with all of that said, let's move on to the last two categories we have. The leaders. Those. Best actress. Jay, what do you got? I just got to say first, uh, before I get into that, I, I think I'm underrating all of us strangers. That's the one movie that I'm thinking about. And I'm like, I think I'm yes, wrong about that one. I like it. I just don't love it. I think I'm going to record it. I, I, need to, I might need to watch it again. Yeah. Uh, maybe but maybe. anyway, on to Best Actress. Uh, the J special nominee here is going to be Jennifer Lawrence for No Hard Feelings. She has <laughs> just a <laughs> natural magnetism that you cannot teach yeah. and is given the Herculean task of propping that mediocre movie on her shoulders and she does it with incredible yeah. aplomb. I, I, I yeah. think she's wonderful totally in that committed. movie yeah. and mm-hmm. just totally going for it and just completely rowing with everybody else in that, uh, in that mm-hmm. boat of no hard feelings. Uh, I have Greta Lee for past lives, wonderful kind of start to her major movie career. Mm-hmm. I have Margot Robbie for Barbie. Again, that movie relies entirely on her being yeah. all in on that performance. And she really, really is for the comedic parts, for the dramatic parts. She nails all of it. Uh, I have Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla, another kind of one woman show performance. And then Emma Stone for Poor Things. You want to talk about giving yourself over to a piece of art. Emma Stone completely transforms becomes someone else just a bold brazen brash performance uh where she has no inhibitions whatsoever and she is wonderful uh in that film but my winner is going to be among those mega superstar names i'm going to give it to kaylee spaney uh for priscilla Uh, okay she is remarkable in that film and again she is tasked with capturing all of the insecurities and the joy and the doubt and the love that comes with with youth uh, from adolescence into young adulthood uh, and and she just does all of it so well it's such a hard task and this is a smaller film where she is asked to do most of everything and mm-hmm. fortunately she has a wonderful script and a, and a wonderful director uh, to work with but her ability to just kind of capture the the sadness and the despair of Priscilla that this movie is striving for uh, is really immaculate. She's uh, she's like now on this short list again of people who it's like, yeah. what is she going to do next? Because yeah. she is yeah. now a she's, capital I important uh, actor in the world of Hollywood. So yeah. she's going to be starring in the new starring in the new Alien film, if I'm not mistaken, by Fede that's right. Alvarez. The Fede yeah. Alvarez movie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Good stuff. I like Fede Alvarez. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Except for the girl in the spider's web, whatever the heck it's called. If that really Are you counts. Kidding me? That was my number three movie of its year. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> you be at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, which scale are you talking yeah. about there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, good stuff. Ryan, what do you got? I, I love that. I love Kaylee Spaney, and that's why she is a nominee for me for Priscilla. I also have Greta Lee for Past Lives. Carrie Mulligan for Maestro. Uh, regardless of what any ding-dongs think about oh, it, that darling. movie. Oh, darling. 
Oh. I, love, I love that performance, and I don't give a shit. And I'll include Jay in with the ding dongs on that one. She's, um, she's, she's not bad in that movie. But. She's very good in that movie. It's easy. It's uh, a very easy performance to make fun of. Yes. Um, Natalie Portman for May, December. And my last uh, pick is is someone that uh, really is getting no attention, but really should, and that's Anjanu Ellis Taylor for Origin. I think she's absolutely yeah, that's a good performance. That yeah, really, really great. Um, my winner here is Greta Lee. Um, I think that it's very easy to play your creator, your director. I mean, look at last year with somebody you know like Gabriel LaBelle or others in the past that have played someone that is a a version of of their of their director of their writer but i think what greta lee does here with nora is absolutely special and i think mm-hmm. that it is um that it's it is a it's it has a lot to do almost with um with a lot of the performances i tend to start gravitating towards as i get older which is the lush yeah. flashier ones i know i just nominated carrie mulligan but i think that there's moments that all these performances have within their quiet that they have yeah and, yeah for sure and i think lee has so many of that under the surface and she is at constant conflict throughout that entire film leading up to jd you mentioned it but that that walk that she walks back to her husband to yeah. and she's an absolute mess by it and we are as well and, and the movie the only villain in past lives is time and the ocean that divides these two characters there's no john mago is not a character hey soon is not a character like nobody nobody's bad here and she's trying to as a woman explore these mixed emotions and feelings that she has for her past and her present mm-hmm. in order to then be able to reconcile them with them and go forward and lee does them with just almost ease of a veteran actress but someone that definitely is on the rise and um it's it's truly a performance that it i think if that performance doesn't work the movie doesn't work and Mm -hmm. she's she's truly special there and uh it's a performance i haven't been able to stop thinking about i almost gave it to natalie portman um, Mm -hmm. who i think Mm -hmm. is giving the best work of her performance i mean uh, best work of her career with that performance i think she's amazing and made it de- made some de- yeah she's she's <laughs> yeah. no she Too but bad. she's incredible at it <laughs> yeah, um exactly. uh you know because she was one there's of the some bad, bad natalie portman discourse this year too yeah there's, there's May a December, yeah. just a bad bad delivery system of a uh, conversation exactly mm-hmm. but um hey, hopefully that means people remember it in the years to come yeah yes but um that was one where better. netflix being from netflix worked in his favor actually a lot absolutely of yeah watch that one yeah, yeah. but <clears throat> Greta Lee, past lives, my winner. Yep, she's a nominee for me alongside Natalie Portman for May, December, uh, Margot Robbie for Barbie, Kaylee Spaney for Priscilla, and my last nominee here, Alma Poisty for Fallen Leaves. Um, I'm going to echo Jay. Kaylee Spaney gives my favorite female lead performance of the year. Mm. Uh, Maybe I just tap into the innocence of characters portrayed in that way. It's kind of a me thing that just tends to really respond well for me. But one of the things I love about her performance, Kaylee Spaney specifically, is it's sort of similar to what I talked about with Charles Melton for May, December. Uh, Because Sofia Coppola's script, as much as I love it for that film, there is a simplicity to it. It does establish a lot of its groundwork very early, uh, whether it be thematically or narratively. By the 10-minute mark, you kind of know exactly where this story is going to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that works in favor for Spaley's performance because that means she then has to essentially direct the arc of the entire film spaley does spaney does uh, b- because she's basically creating the character as it goes so in many ways kaylee spaney's kind of doing all of the heavy lifting for that movie to really be as powerful and uh de- devastating as it is to really navigate those waters and take it to where it needs to go and that's a very difficult task so for those reasons i think kaylee spaney really gives one of the more challenging performances of the year that we don't often recognize as a challenging performance. Uh, But I do think it really is quite great. I can't wait to see what she does next. I think it's wonderful work. Yeah. She's really, really great in that film. A nominee for me as well. My other four nominees, Sandra Huller, Anatomy of a Fall, Greta Lee for Past Lives, Natalie Portman for May, December, and Emma Stone 
or poor things. Before you um, get to your winner, JD, I just want to acknowledge something. Did no one have Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon? was my number six here. I went <laughs> she back exists and forth in this weird her. middle ground of lead and supporting for me where I just couldn't I really... couldn't decide. Like I, mm. I know in this case she's being campaigned for lead and that's I, what's being recognized, but I, I, I tend to go back yeah. and forth on what I think yeah. it is. Here here's the thing. I think Lily Gladstone gives a wonderful performance. She will have a gold statue in two months. Three yeah. months. Mm-hmm. And but Ryan, she's I, gonna be so pissed when she hears this episode. I know <laughs> <laughs> she'll be fine um she'll be fine i talked to her last night um but um literally i did not to brag um but <laughs> but i am but i did and i can um and she's gonna have a an oscar and i wanted to highlight some other performances from a truly stacked year for best actress sure and, and a, a lot of those performances are just like kaylee spaney and Najinu ellis and maybe even greta lee and natalie portman all four of those actresses are not in the Oscar conversation nearly as loud as someone like Lily Gladstone. And I know that's not the biggest thing in the world, but she she will she's gonna be fine. She's Lily Gladstone yeah. for Christ's sake. She's I, in a Mark I, Scorsese movie. It is a I'm stacked glad, year. Yeah. I'm it's glad stacked. you brought it up though, because I did still heavily think about her for this category. Mm-hmm. So I will say if we did decide, hey, let's put her in supporting, I probably would have made room for her in supporting. Yeah. But yeah. given that she's campaigning as lead and maintaining the spirit of that, I struggled with her and, and where she fit in here. Ultimately, yeah. she came in at sixth for me, but I'm glad it's brought up because I do love her. I love the performance, and I'm still rooting like crazy for her to win the Oscar. I'll be thrilled for her to win. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, just it, it, it was it was a struggle, but but still love her in that film. I mean, all these other nominees that we're talking about, if they were nominated in any other year, they could be potential front one front runners. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So with all of that laid out, as far as my five nominees go, my winner here, and I know we haven't talked about this this film a whole lot tonight. I I still do really love it, but man, I'm enthralled by Emma Stone and Poor Things. I okay, absolutely okay. adore what she's doing. It's one of her most inspired performance is I love the complexity of it. Extremely diverting, wonderfully aberrant. And I just, I love the evolution of it. Th- those early scenes when we first see Bella as this toddler, as someone who at the time when I saw that film, Andrew was seven months old and yeah. seeing him on the floor as I'm watching Emma Stone on screen essentially being the same age, I was floored by how verbatim the same the two are. Like it's, it's incredible. The (laughs) baby research mechanics and the detail, like the level of detail she gives into being a seven month old, uh, astounded me just being able to directly look at mine as she's doing it on screen blew me away. Yeah. Uh, but even as the film goes, like the way she carries herself, the specific mannerisms in her movement, the noises that she echoes verbally, it's just incredible. I just, I love how surreal the performance is um, and, and how it morphs given the film's ideas of sexual liberation and discovery and this self-assured empowerment that we see in the character and, and how Emma Stone taps into that in this incredibly brazen way. Uh, I just love it's one of her very best, if not her best performances. And uh, you say what mm-hmm. you will about the film, but that performance I think is just unquestioned. Bold. It's very it's, bold it's and daring. Absolutely, yeah, I have wonderful. to give it. Yeah, that give movie. It what that. that movie does well, it does incredibly well, including yeah. probably first and foremost her performance. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the thing that really works for me as well as her performance. Yeah, incredible, good stuff. Emma Stone is my winner for best actress. All right, last category, gentlemen. Let's All right, to part two. Uh, here we go for best actor. Jay, what do you got? My nominees for best actor are Zach Efron in The Iron Claw. Dude, first of all, just looks, he's built like a Ford mm-hmm. F 350 in that movie. A mm-hmm. Unbelievable. <laughs> I challenge him also, to an arm wrestle. Who kind of who who kind of knew he had it in him? I'm not sure <clears throat> I knew he had that. Uh, in him, so. I had that, I have some of that stock. I've had it for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you what I loved him in was uh, The Beach Bum. 
I love yeah. the Roach Bone. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. But, a great uh, callback. But yeah. he'd never really been given the chance to give a performance I, that not, raw not, and right. real. Uh, yeah. And I, I love that somebody gave it to him. Yeah. The J special uh, in this category is going to be Jamie Foxx in The Burial. The only oh, performer yes. who mm. had more raw presence in a movie this year was Godzilla. Um, so <laughs> Jamie Foxx, both just, about as I mean, fiery, that's for sure. Unbelievably electric, just absolute force of nature in that movie. Um, next, I've got Paul Giamatti for the holdovers. Uh, that one's been talked about to death. Just yeah. uh, an unbelievably good performance there. Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. Um, we've brought up Oppenheimer a few times. Yep. Uh, and then my final nominee here is going to be Andrew Scott for all of us strangers. I think Andrew Scott is kind of like a super mega ultra talent. Uh, and he's mm-hmm. amazing in that film. Again, I need to watch it again. I, yeah. I think I like that movie more than I think I have said I have. So, um, but he undeniably is, is magnetic and, uh, so heartbreaking, uh, in, yeah. in yeah. that movie. So, um, but my winner, and this is just like, it's kind of up there with like Daniel Day Lewis and There Will Be Blood. I think it's Killian Murphy. It's like this is the definitive performance of the year for me. It he is, he captures the best of what, in my opinion, the definitive film of the year um, is trying to communicate. And mm-hmm. he is just such a vessel for Christopher Nolan in communicating this, you know, grand Promethean story. Um, and Killian Murphy oscillates between like, so internalized. And then he does have this kind of innate charm to him that exudes through kind of the awkwardness that, uh, Oppenheimer has in the film. It's like this wonderful balancing mm-hmm. act that he's able to do. Uh, and there's just sort of an underlining intensity to it all. So for me, we're talking like all time definitive, put it on the acting reel of American cinema history type stuff. So I'm going to give it to Killian Murphy. That's yeah. high praise right there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, just wait a minute. Um, how about that? Um, <laughs> now I'm my nervous. nominees, my nominees <laughs> are Christian Friedel for the zone of interest. No one is talking about that performance, which is a, it's a good damn one. shame. Yeah. yeah. Michael Fassbender for the killer. Um, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, Franz Rosagowski for Passages, which is a, a fantastic performance, and Andrew Scott for All of Us Strangers. Um, and Andrew Scott was, I mean, I was I was very 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 close to give this to Andrew Scott, who I think is the one of the giant reasons why that movie works, and he's mm-hmm. so great, and it's lovely to see him get a moment in the sun to shine in a lead performance like this. But Jay is absolutely right. And I'm going to take what Jay says and I'm going to take a step further. Oh man. I thought I went pretty far. So when you think of all time, great performances in biopics, I think of like Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia. I think of uh, F. Murray Abraham in Amadeus. I think of, Denzel Washington in Malcolm X. Um, these movies that for me are directorial achievements, but also are completely all within the singular performance by an individual. And if this thing falls off the rails, it is not because of the other parts. It's because of that performance alone and everything about that movie that you like hinders about that performance and i Mm -hmm. think that killian murphy has been he has been an absolutely great actor for throughout his entire career about 25 30 years on the red eye baby and and i love him in that movie this is the opportunity with a guy who has seen the potential in him for so long and christopher nolan his longest collaborator he gets to shine in the biggest movie in the world and it's also it's it at times like Jay says it's showy, but at times a lot of it is internalized. You're talking, you talked, we you know, y'all scene of the year is about him trying to emotionally keep it together within the gymnasium, yeah. and that's just opposes mm-hmm. itself it's later a to a lot of the stuff with yeah. Jason Clark. You know, you're all of the reaction 
to not just the the nuclear tests working there, the Trinity tests working there in Los Alamos, but then the reaction then later to it uh, having full effect in Japan. And while everyone is celebrating, you are looking at his face mm -hmm. and seeing the horror of his creation. A lot of quiet performance. And it's so, mm -hmm. so good. It is, I think, one of the defining you know, biopic performances we've seen in the last 25 years. And I think that wow. it is definitely the best work of his career. It's something also too, Red that eye. we have to we, shut up. Jay. We have to <laughs> red eye. So good. We have to give him <laughs> his great flowers because when you talk with him, I, and I had the privilege of interviewing him for awards watch. He is someone that does not like to talk about himself. He is very much, he gave a lot of praise to Nolan, to Downey, to Blunt, to Hoyt Van Hoytema, to everybody else that did this movie. And I think then that makes it our job to give him his flowers and give his moment to really shine because he deserves it. He is fantastic in this movie. And I, and I love it. Yeah. Geez, that, that high praise there, Ryan. And he's not even your quote unquote performance of the year. That's no, he's the, no, no, he's the second best performance of the year. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, it's the best performance in 25 years, but the well, this, second best performance this year. Well, yeah. Yeah. This, this brings this brings the ultimate question to the table. Is Charles Melton giving a biopic performance? No, 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 no. Don't start down that discourse. We are proving why May, December needed to exist in our time. <laughs> really? You're right about that. Oh, what a movie. What a movie. Good Killy stuff. Murphy, Killy Murphy, Oppenheimer, a nominee for me as well, including Zac Efron for the Iron Claw, Paul Giamatti for the Holdovers, uh, Tay Yu for Past Lives, and Koji Akusho for Perfect Days. I'm going to break the trend. My winner is Koji Akushu for Perfect Days, by a slight margin. I can't. I, I mean, Killian Murphy is giving a toilet wonderful culture. performance. Uh, to, toilet culture. This this movie is just it, it, to, Tokyo toilet man. That's that's that. It's a business opportunity scrub, waiting scrub, to happen. Scrub scrub, scrub just like in Wonka. Akushu gives my favorite performance of the entire year. Oh, I uh, forgot about Chalamet. <laughs> Oh, that's that's chocolate. That's not shit right there. Um, wait, but... wait, you mean you're talking about chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to, I had to do it. Uh, Koji Yakushu gives my favorite performance of the entire year, but I'm kind of biased. I'm very like emotionally susceptible to um, uh, movies that are just very introspective and expressive like his performances here. I just have a soft spot for these kind of performances that are very they're just they're not reliant on words and he barely speaks in this movie unless he has to uh, and his sense of expression is all building towards an expressive explosion by the end which is one of my favorite scenes of the year the utilization of that song feeling good by nina simone and how that all just builds to some grand conclusion uh I, I just there, there's a certain level of difficulty in that performance and trying to portray so much when there really is barely even a script at all. I, 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 th yeah. There's barely even any writing to this movie. It's all based on how it's visualized from Wim Wenders and how it's performed in this case. Uh, but I think just given that li given its limited nature and what was able to be conveyed, I think it is a very, a very challenging work and a wonderful piece of performance. So uh, I think it's great, but. You know, in time, I could see myself giving it to Killian Murphy, and I think he is going to win the Oscar. He did win the uh, Golden Globe as we're recording this, so uh, mm. there's definitely a lot of love for him as well. Uh, but there is something just very, th there's something very like lingering for me about Koji Yakusho in Perfect Days that I just can't shake, and I just I had to give it to him. So if I broke the trend, I'm sorry, everyone, but I just I love his performance big, in this one. Big proponent of physical media as well, so we, we love that. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. For that <laughs> that yeah. movie spoke to me as a music collector, especially like the like I've noticed the trend building towards cassette tapes making a comeback as well. Not just vinyl, but cassette tapes making a comeback. Well, somebody I, needs we've to had, sell the car manufacturers. Someone needs to. CDs might even come back too. So if Perfect Days is the reason for that boom to start back up again, I'll be the one there to say I told you so. Yeah, I love that. Give me yeah. a good cassette tape. I got oh, I just a new the one thanks it's so to cool. Amazon this Let year. Let me rewind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have to put work into listening to your music. You had to put yeah. work into it. You it did. took time. 
Yeah. No, it's a great performance. I echo you and all of that. Brendan Koji Yakusho is a nominee for me as well. My other four nominees, Andrew Scott, All of Us Strangers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. One of my mm. favorites Almost of made the my year list. as well. Jeffrey Wright, one of the MVPs of the year. Yeah. In general. Yeah, Completely him and, what, and Asteroid City. Ooh. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. My winner here... I will also buck the trend, although I completely agree with what you guys had to say about Murphy and his performance in Oppenheimer. However, unlike some of these other categories, when we're talking score, director, editing, there's simply no denying the craftsmanship of Oppenheimer when it comes to those specific things. Yeah. And I love Murphy. I agree. If he goes on to win the Oscar, I will be extremely thrilled for him. Yeah. But this is one category where I don't think it's that clear cut for me because mm-hmm. Paul Giamatti and the holdovers will not he's, leave my he's brain. He's really good. Yeah. He will wow. not leave my that, brain. That is not that, where that, I thought that this would go. That football, that football just can't leave, right? <laughs> it just can't you can't get like you can't let go of that football. It's football season right now. <laughs> exactly. He, he's oh, okay. he's Charlie Brown. Oh, I like this JD. No, no, yeah. no. I didn't think you were going there, but what do you love about it so much? I I I think this is maybe the best performance of his career. And I think what's so great about it is throughout the film, Giamatti has to tiptoe between being teacher and mentor. He becomes somewhat of a paternal figure, but he's forced into this situation. At times he's even combatant to Angus. And then ultimately we see it evolve into this cordial friendship. Brennan talked at length about, the the ending of this film, this moment where yeah. we see him go in and kind of confront the uh, what would you call him the the uh, the leader of the school essentially like the headmaster and, and the headmaster yeah. and he does it in this incredibly poignant way. It's funny, like on the on the surface, it's this funny moment, but when you couple that with what he's really fighting for, and he's doing it in this really passionate way. Uh, there is a tender quality to it as well. And I just, mm. so I love that evolution. Just that whole idea we see at the beginning of him being wholly disliked by his, by the staff and students. He's almost belligerent with the little power he has. He's insufferable, but in this endlessly captivating kind of way, there's the whole eye element of the film that's really great. Mm. So like there's, there is this really funny quirkiness to the character that is almost deconstructed through this unexpected relationship. And for me, that is the heart of the film that that is the underlying thematic current that I keep going back to how we are sometimes thrust in these circumstances that are wholly unexpected, but they end up defining our lives. And that is absolutely the case for these two characters and how GMI taps into that. I, I just, I find so funny yet, so thoughtful and poignant and and I just I can't stop thinking about it. And one of my favorite performances of the year for sure. It's this one. And, and this and is I the one you should be looking at. Yeah. Uh and for me I, I think this might be Giamatti's best. I, I, love, I it. love it. I love yeah. it. I think I it's think great. The that movie great. Yeah. that might be the number one like bridging the gap between everybody normies and cinephiles just like mm-hmm. recommendable yep. genuinely just as long as they don't sit next to me of the year. it's i think it's the most rewatchable film of the year yeah yeah, yeah. Long, of, yeah. of its of its ilk yeah as far yeah. as being like a true work of art and yeah, being one, where, one where you buy the popcorn share with the normies and watch it yeah mm-hmm. it's, it's just good, crazy that they dug it up from yeah. 1976 yeah, it was yeah. weird. It's been sitting yeah. there for 50 it's been years. sitting there for like 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty crazy how that yeah. Those opening yeah. titles he card, I was like, wow. Giamatti hasn't changed a throwback. A bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, I think similar to Murphy, like this is one of those performances where on each watch, and this is the one film I've actually seen a couple of times, yeah. at least of those that came out during award season. And I I, just, I feel like I picked up on so much more in Gia, on Gia, in Giamatti's performance on that second go around. Yeah, and I'm sure the the case is very much the same for for Murphy as well, and really yeah. any of these performers we, we've been talking about. But I, I feel like in terms of the nuances that Giamatti's tapping into, 
you know, the way the eye shifts throughout the, like that alone is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And and just that dynamic he has with Dominic Sessa, I just think is incredible. Like this, it's just a sophistication that I just, I I don't know if we've seen from Giamani in in quite some time, maybe since the last time he worked with. Pain. Yeah, it's a quirky performance that's not divine that's not defined by quirks, no. which is a hard thing to do because like so many times you see a performance in a character and they're only defined by their quirks, but they have like no layers to them. Uh, but he's giving a very quirky performance, but it's not about those quirks. There, well, there's a, there's actually something there of substance. Yeah. And to take it a step further, I think those quirks are actually hiding something because Oh no, they're are, layers. Yeah. Yeah, because mm. we we find out that you know, the the character, he's working at this institution because he has to, because he can't yeah. really find anything else because of an incident that happened when he was back in college. And and so, yeah, there's there's like this limitation to him that yeah. he masked by being quirky, by being belligerent, yeah. you know, by yeah. treating the students the way he does, even treating other staff the way he does. Like there's reasons for it that you know, again, are, are deconstructed as it goes. And I just, Penis Jumani, cancer. <laughs> yeah, the big, I mean, the most, the most 1970s thing about that movie is letting a guy like Paul Giamatti lead a big Hollywood movie like that. That's yeah. part of what mm-hmm. makes it so great. Uh, yeah. And he is oh, a holiday movie a too, for that for matter. Yeah. 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 I don't know. How did the thing do business wise? Did that make money? I feel like it had to have. That's a I great question. No, I'd have I to look it up. No, I'm going to look that up now. Yeah, we're all looking it up right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but it made those big Santa buckaroos. <laughs> Looks like box office was just under $21 million, but I don't know what its budget was. So nobody's... Well, it wasn't uh, in theaters for very long because... That's it's true. Now it's they all, released yeah, it digitally. It's pretty streaming pretty and yeah, they digital. released yeah, it digitally yeah, like right. three weeks after it came out. It was like by Thanksgiving yeah. or shortly yeah, after. Got, Gotta remember, they're I think they're Focus Features, and Focus Features is owned by Universal, and Universal owns a, a little movie called Oppenheimer that made nine hundred and fifty yeah. million dollars. Yeah, so I think they're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, I think they just assumed this would be an awards player, but yeah. I, I feel like yeah. they yeah, yeah, missed yeah. an opportunity, especially given the response to it. I think this no, is I felt, I felt like the, the timing of it, like this was was a great opportunity to get people to go to the movies for I'm, the holiday season. Yeah. I'm not trying to compare the films because I think the holdovers is a far superior film, but it definitely could have been like a almost like green book sort of vibe to it where they released that movie at mm-hmm. Thanksgiving, much like they did with this movie and let that movie carry its way through the, you know, for audiences like, to find it. Holiday season. Um, that's a, pr- that's a pre pandemic sort of thing. A uh, mindset sure. as opposed to post pandemic. So I had to keep that in mind, but, um, but yeah, mm-hmm. holdovers I think is a really, really good movie and, Pain's maybe best film since Sideways for me, for me at least. I and think that it's was probably like the, since Election for me. Yeah, and it might uh, be my favorite of his from Pain. Yeah, honestly. it's 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 genuinely rewatchable. I watched it with uh, with the family during the holiday, and it was my second go round. I agree with you, JD. Um, I picked up so much more on the on the second go round, but I've seen Oppenheimer six times, seen it seven times this week, and probably going to see it an eighth time by the end of the year. Twenty four hours of Oppie. <laughs> Sounds about right. Gosh, I wish I had your free time. Hey, you know yeah, what? I think I've seen Don't like three all? or four movies this year multiple times. And that's about and it. And Oppie was yeah, one of I them. I didn't did. do many rewatches. I really didn't. Oppie, I, I, Ferrari. I've seen Guardians of the Galaxy twice. Yeah. Well, I saw I saw your letterbox stats, Jay, and you and I are almost identical. Very, very close to being identical. So welcome to fatherhood. Living that there dad it is. life. There it is. <laughs> yep. Living that dad life. Yeah. So. Yeah. When I when I have a kid, JD is going to be like, "Did Told you get to you. watch Oppenheimer <laughs> two twice?" And I'm like, "No, I only saw it four times." <laughs> exactly. Took the baby oh, with me. Gosh. Took him to those I'm those Alamo you. screenings. You know yeah. What I mean? so. uh, at any rate, that's the 2023 In Session Film Awards. At least part one. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll discuss Best Picture, our top ten movies. Of 2023. So yep. thank you for listening and sticking yeah. to the end here. Thanks, Ryan and Jay, for being here. Yeah. We really do nice. appreciate you guys. This was a ton of fun. Uh, so uh, we're, we're finally here at the end for part one, but really do appreciate guys being here. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. 
Uh, let us know if you agree or disagree with any of our picks here. Mm-hmm. Um, we will have a list of all the nominees and winners on our website and in sessionfilm.com. So if you were overwhelmed by everything we had to say and you need a place to just look at it in depth, in detail, we will have that available at in sessionfilm.com mm-hmm. later on in the week. So be on the lookout for that as well. Um, with that said, that's it. Part one That's is done. It. That's the Inception Film Awards. Part two yeah. is coming very soon. Uh, so stay uh, stay tuned for that. And we'll see you guys next time on the Inception Film Podcast. Go blue. Is that what I have go to blue. say, Jake? Go blue. Yes, go blue. <laughs> <laughs>